Bunga gamtang di jeti peramu Terang warnanya bagaikan bara Selamat datang para tetamu Dengan izin memulakan acara Burung tempua hingga merata Sayang merbah di pohon cemara Assalamualaikum pemula kata Awal bismillah pembuka bicara Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin Wa ala ali wa sahbihi ajma'in Yang berbahagia Profesor Datuk Teknologis Dr. Muhammad Razali bin Muhammad Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic and In International University Technical Malaysia Melaka yang berbahagia, Associate Professor Dr. Zambari bin Jamaluddin, Dean of Fakulti Kejuteraan Pembuatan University of Te University Technical Malaysia Melaka. Yang berusaha, Professor Dr. Esah binti Hamzah, Chairperson of IMM MLC, presenting on behalf of President IMM. Yang berusaha, Associate Professor Dr. Jariah binti Muhammad Joy, Chairperson of MLC 2019, Respected Guests, Sponsor Bodies, Finalists, ladies and gentlemen, first and foremost, I would like to thank everyone in this auditorium for allocating time a part of your busy schedule to attend MLC Final 2019. My name is Muhammad Shahrizan bin Osman. And my name is Fatima binti Muhammad Razai. And on behalf of MLC 2019 Organizing Committee, we would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. Respected guests, ladies and gentlemen, bunga mawar cantik tersemat di petik gadis di tepi titi. Doa dibaca di memohon berkat. Moga majlis sentiasa diberkati. In order to bless this ceremony, we would like to call upon Dr. Muhammad Edi Rozi bin Abdul Mana for the dua recitation. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirabbil alamin wassalatu wassalamu ala asyrafil anbiya wal mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajmain. Segala puji bagi Allah Tuhan sekalian alam. Selawat dan salam kepada Nabi Junjungan Nabi Muhammad SAW Dan para sahabatnya dan mereka yang mencontohinya hingga hari kiamat Allahumma ya Allah Pada hari yang berkat lagi bersejarah ini Sempena majlis MLC 2019 ini Kami menadah tangan dan bersyukur kehadratmu Di atas nikmat Limpah kuniamu yang tidak terhingga ke atas kami Sehingga kami dapat hidup dengan aman Damai dan harmoni serta dapat melaksanakan tugas-tugas kami di muka bumi ini dan dipohonkan jadikanlah majlis kami ini majlis yang engkau redai dan berkati Ya Latif Ya Rahman gunakanlah kami taufik dan hidayahmu bimbinglah, bimbinglah kami ke arah kejayaan keamanan kecemerlangan dan kesejahteraan di dalam kehidupan kami di dunia maupun di akhirat jadikanlah kami orang-orang yang bertakwa sentiasa mematuhi perintahmu dan menjauhi laranganmu Ampunilah dosa dan ketelanjuran kami dan jadilah, jadikanlah kami orang-orang yang berada dalam keredaan mujur. Ya Munzilal Barakat, berkatilah bumi bertuah ini. Jayakanlah segala usaha yang kami anjurkan selama ini. Mudah-mudahan ianya dapat memberi manfaat dan mempertingkatkan pengetahuan yang berkaitan dengan bidang tugas seharian kami, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, terimalah segala kerja dan khidmat bakti kami dengan sempurna. Dan dikira sebagai amat ibadat kami kepada mujur Kami juga memohon perlindungan darimu dari segala perkara yang boleh mencacat celakan majlis kami Dan dari segala perkara yang melalaikan kami dari berbuat taat kepadamu Kepada mujur kami serah segala urusan kami Rabbana atina fid dunia hasanah Wa fil akhirati hasanah wa kina azabanar Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin Thank you, Dr. Edi. 
uh, respected guests, ladies and gentlemen, bukan rumput sebarang rumput, rumput penghias tepi halaman, bukan jemput sebarang jemput, jemput memohon kata Alwan. Without further ado, we would like to invite yang berusaha Associate Professor Dr. Zambari bin Jamaluddin, Dean of Fakulti Kejuteraan Pembuatan for the welcoming speech. Please welcome yang berusaha. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh And uh, very good morning to all <coughs> uh, Firstly, uh, uh, thank you very much to uh, our two, uh, gen uh, two MC here yeah, To uh, Mr. Sharizan and uh, Ms. Fatima uh, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, yang berbahagia uh, Professor Datuk Teknologis uh, Dr. Muhammad Azali bin Muhammad, our Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academic and Internalization. Uh, Yang Rusa Associate uh, Professor Dr. Jariah binti Muhammad Joy, uh, Chairman and Chairperson for the uh, MLC 2019 uh, Committee. Uh, Yang Rusa uh, Prof. Dr. Isa binti Hamza, uh, IMM MLC Chairman. Yang Rusa Professor Dato Insinyur Dr. Abdul Wahab bin Muhammad of UKM, uh, Moderator for the MLC 2019 uh, Final. Honorable Judges, uh, Associate Professor Insinyur Dr. Puan Naswaran and Alaki uh, Rumau, uh, Engineer Insinyur Fairuliza Minti Isha, and uh, Insinyur William Ho. Uh, and uh, also uh, to our co-sponsors of, of MLC 2019, a fellow university representative, uh, finalist uh, from University Malaysia Kelantan, uh, University Malaysia uh, Sabah, University Technology Malaysia, Yusi Putra Malaysia and Yusi Naya. A round of applause uh, for this uh, five uh, uh, families of uh, this uh, event this morning. Uh, to uh, ladies and gentlemen of MLC 2019, uh, first of all, I would like to, to extend our welcome on behalf of UTEM and also FKP, uh, Faculty of Manufacturing Engineering, UTEM. Uh, to all the finalists of MLC 2019, your presence here is a testament of you and your institution ability to nurture your ability and at the same time promote advanced research and development studies. So on behalf of UTEM and FKP, we are honoured to be given this opportunity to jointly organise the 8th Material Lecture Competition for Malaysia uh, with the uh, Institute of uh, Material Malaysia. So this competition is, is in fact a, a great platform for our young minds uh, to be exposed to the challenges of presenting your ideas and research with uh, eloquent and, and flair. To showmanship skills are uh, important. Those, push, push, sorry, those, push, uh, those showmanship skills are important. The content of your work and study are also of equal importance. I hope that uh, all the participants of MLC 2019 in both the semi-finals and today's final uh, would learn and gain from this experience and apply it in your future uh, endeavors. Uh, last year, our own Andrew Ng K. Lab from UM uh, did us proud by placing third in IOM, uh, IOM pre World Lecture Competition 2018. So uh, we hope that uh, whoever won uh, this event uh, this, uh, this morning would be even better. So furthermore, we have placed third place for two years consec consecutively, and hopefully this year we could improve on that. To the winner of MLC 2019, uh, you bring our nation's hope at the world stage. Finally, uh, I would like uh, to extend my heartiest uh, congratulations and appreciation to all the MLC 2019 committee, uh, led by Associate Professor uh, Dr. Jaria. Uh, your team, uh, tireless uh, dedication and commitment uh, surely ensure uh, the whole event uh, organized uh, smoothly. So uh, to the Institute of Material Malaysia and sponsors, uh, uh, especially uh, DKSH Technologies Nia Merhat, uh, Bestaris Nia Merhat, HML Auto Industries Nia Merhat, and Zeta Scientific uh, Nia Merhat. Your trust and contribution in organizing uh, this event is uh, uh, greatly appreciated. And of course, without all of you, uh, this event would not be uh, uh, materialized. So from myself, on behalf of the uh, faculty and, and, and of course with them, 
and also the MLC 2019 Organizing Committee. I would like to welcome you to uh, Material IT Competition 2019 and have a good finals uh, and thank you all I and mean, may Allah bless us, best all of us. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, for this speech. Kalau Tuan pikat kenari, jangan patahkan batang jerami. Kepada Tuan, sembah diberi. Mohon rasmikan majlis kami. Now we would like to invite yang berbahagia Professor Tatuk Teknologis Dr. Muhammad Razali bin Muhammad, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic and Internationalization for the Officiation Speech of MLC Final 2019. Please welcome yang berbahagia Datuk. Thank you very much, Chairperson, uh, uh, for chairing this uh, session. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning and welcome everybody to this uh, uh, Materials Lecture Competition 2019. And uh, first of all, I would like to uh, uh, give my view uh, acknowledgement to Yamu Bahagia Assistant Professor Peter Zamri bin Jamaluddin, the Dean of Faculty of Manufacturing Engineering and Advisor for the uh, MLC 2019. Uh, yang berusaha, Professor Madia Dr. Jareh bin T. Muhammad Joy, the uh, Chairperson for the MLC 2019. Yang berusaha, Professor Dr. Esah bin T. Hamzah, the uh, Institute of uh, Materials Malaysia uh, ML and uh, MLC uh, Chairperson, also uh, a good good friend of mine, uh, long uh, quite a number of years back. Eh? <laughs> we were together last time. If you remember, there was uh, this Irfa Grand. Uh, yeah, so we were in the same team. Yang uh, berusaha Profesor Dato Ir Dr Abdul Wahab bin Muhammad, moderator for the final of MLC. Uh, 2019. Also, uh, long time associate. Uh, I mean, we were together in the Majlis Dekan, eh? Majlis Dekan Kejuruteraan and so on. So, and uh, of course, to our honourable judges, uh, Associate Professor I R Dr Pur Purwanas Warren, uh, Peruma. Uh, this uh, has got to be my <laughs> uh, good friend. Uh, of course, I used to be the uh, model, uh, what? <coughs> supervisor. But of course, now he's, he's better than me. Uh, good. I am Farulizam Ben uh, Ishak. Uh, yeah, welcome. Uh, I am William Ho. Thank you very much for uh, sacrificing your time to be with us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, also a representative from the sponsors, uh, also thank you very much. Without your support, uh, this event would have not been uh, successful. Uh, respected guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, actually, uh, I am very glad to be here today uh, to sort of officiate this uh, uh, event. I think at one point, I was invited and I had to turn it down for some reason. Huh? Oh, it was so funny, yeah. So, you know, fit, happy, happy that, you know, I, I will be here. Because the, the, the Vice Chancellor uh, instructed me, you know, Datuk, please, uh, uh, because he has to chair a meeting, uh, you know, now. So he, ha he, has, he has asked me to, uh, to represent him to this uh, uh, final, which I really uh, uh, enjoy because to me, this is the kind of uh, uh, activities that would enhance the academic development of, uh, of students. But unfortunately, uh, I noticed that the, uh, the hall is uh, yet to be, uh, yet to be filled, I suppose. Tidak tak tak imbas student material, lah. Yeah. 
because uh, this this is a Tuesday morning because last Sunday night I officiated here also the final of the uh, uh, UTM debate uh, competition and I, I think the, 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 the auditorium was quite full <laughs> so that's the, the the shortcoming of being uh, asked to uh, officiate the various events to so tend to compare and contrast things you know <laughs> Okay, this thing there, uh, members of the audience, first of all, I would like to extend my gratitude to the IMMM and the IO Triple M uh, for the opportunity given to FKP and UTEM to host the semi final and the final of the material lecture com uh, competition 2019. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, the faculty has done a good job in organizing uh, this thing, of course, with the help of other departments of the university and also from our sponsors. Uh, I, I understand that the uh, 20 participants have competed in the semi final on the 4th and uh, 4th of April, and the top five winners have been chosen to compete in the final round today. Uh, so, the winner of today's final uh, round will represent Malaysia and compete at the Young Persons World Lecture Competition 2019 to be held in London, UK in October 2019. So, uh, uh, guys, if you, if you like, if you, uh, you know, would like to experience how autumn is, autumn in UK, <laughs> now perhaps you will really give your best to uh, impress the, uh, the, the judges uh, today, of course, you can still go. Uh, now, Malaysian Airlines offering at two thousand <laughs> <laughs> offer price, you know, at two thousand and uh, five hundred, which is really cheap actually. I mean, quite cheap, relatively cheap. Uh, return flight KL uh, KL KL London. Uh, now, uh, I would like to uh, extend my sincere gratitude to the organi organizing committee who have remained. Uh, who has uh, worked uh, really hard actually, committed and give their best in, in ensuring the success of the uh, MLC 2019. And also my uh, special thanks to our sponsors, DKSH Technologies in Denver Hart. Uh, any, any rep here from DKSH? No? I used to have a good uh, friend in DKSH last time. Uh, um, if anybody know Mr. Mr. Kiong, is there any bell? Uh, he, he used to be the, the market uh, intelligence uh, manager for the KSS. Uh, Taat Bestari is named Bahad. HML O2 Industry is named Bahad. Zeta Scientific and Zeta Scientific is named Bahad. And also for uh, to UTEM and particularly the Center for Graduate Studies for the support you know, to make this event uh, a success. Lastly, I wish all the five uh, young MSC uh, 2019 finalists. All the best, young. Because I was made to understand that uh, uh, that the uh, the limit limiting age is 28. Yeah. So uh, and I'm sure that uh, you are you know energetic, full of uh, uh, enthusiasm, <laughs> full of enthusiasm. Uh, you know, willing to go, ready to fly, so to speak. And uh, you know, I hope you will uh, enjoy yourself uh, uh, in this. Uh, or you, uh, I hope you have enjoyed yourself in this uh, competition. And of course, uh, I think the, there's a pride uh, in being able to represent your respective uh, universities or, or organizations. And finally, the the ultimate prize of actually uh, pride of actually representing Malaysia in London. So that's something that uh, I wish uh, everybody uh, luck in this uh, competition. So, dengan uh, lafaz uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, in the name of Allah, the most beneficent and uh, merciful, I officially uh, launched the Material Lecture Competition 2019. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
you yang berbahagia Datuk for the speech. Respected guests, ladies and gentlemen, we would like re to request yang berusaha Associate Professor Dr. Zambuli bin Jamaluddin, Dean of Fakulti Kecuteraan Pembuatan, Universiti Teknikal Malaysia Melaka, accompanied by yang berusaha Associate Professor Dr. Jariah bin Timamak Joy, Chairperson of MLC 2019, to the stage to present a memento to Deputy Vice Chancellor of UTEM as a token of appreciation. Without further ado, you cordially invite Yang Berbahagia Professor. <laughs> Alright, oh, dia dah naik dah. Alright. Datuk. Sadly enough, we have now come to the end of our opening ceremony. But before we end, let us hope that this year's MLC final will be a successful and most remembered one. Bunga seroja di atas para jatuh ditimpa buah berangan. Andai kata tersilap bicara kemaafan jua kami berdua pohonkan. I now once again would like to invite yang berbahagia Professor Datuk Teknologis Dr. Muhammad Razali bin Muhammad, Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic and Internal. Internalization University Technical Malaysia Melaka accompanied by yang berusaha Associate Professor Dr. Zamri Benjamin Ludin uh, followed by yang berusaha Professor Dr. Esah binti Hamza and yang berusaha Associate Professor Dr. Jarah binti Muhammad Joy finalists, university representative, respected guests judges and all organizing committee members of MLC 2019 for the port photo session followed with some refreshment at the outside of this hall. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning ladies and gentlemen the, uh, our competition will start very very soon all the contestants respected guests ladies and gentlemen you are invited to be seated uh, possibly in the front okay before we start please ensure your electronic devices is switched off or turned to silent mode throughout the event thank you for your kind cooperation Distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning. In the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin. Welcome to the final of the MLC 2019. Distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank everyone in this auditorium once again for allocating your time to be part of MLC 2019. I once again to introduce myself. My name is Sharizan bin Osman. And I'm Fatima binti Muhammad Razai. And on behalf of LC 2019 Organizing Committee, we would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. For this year, we have invited four professionals to be our panel of judges for final. And with that say, allow me to introduce them. It is my pleasure to introduce our first jury and also our moderator for today, Yang Berusaha Professor Datuk Insinyur Dr. Abdul Wahab bin Muhammad. 
who is Professor in Membrane and Separation Technology at the Research Center for Sustainable Process Technology, SESPRO, University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Our next jury is Associate Professor IR Dr. Purvanavasran Lelaki A. Parumal. He is an academician in Fakulti Kejuteraan Pembuatan, University Teknikal Malaysia Melaka. And the second one of our jury is Insinyur Fairolizam bin Isahak, an engineering manager of Syarikat Air Melaka Berhad, SAMB. And our last but not least, Insinyur William Ho, Honorary Treasurer of IEM Melaka Branch. Distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen, before we proceed with our competition, please allow me to highlight once again our ground rules for the competition. Okay, presentation time for each participant is 15 minutes, followed by Q&A session. There will be only, I think, there's no only, there will be three questions per participant for each judge. Uh, one question for one judge. Uh, the judging criteria penalties are similar to those set by Young World Lecture Competition organized by IOM3 UK. Marks will be deducted for the lecture times as follows. Um, number one, for the presentation below 13 minutes or exceeding 17 minutes, five marks will be deducted. Whereas for the presentation below 12 minutes or exceeding 19 minutes, 10 marks will be deducted. Okay, so without further ado, let's welcome our first contestant for today. Come all the way from UMK, University Malaysia, Kelantan, Miss Siti Hajar Zaid Amri. Okay, let me introduce her. Miss Siti Hajar Binti Zaid Amri was born in Negeri Sembilan mm -hmm. on December 9, 1997. She received her early education at Sekolah Kebangsaan Taman Sri Pagi and then continued to Sri Putri Science School Kuala Lumpur for secondary education. After completed her SPM, she pursued her study in Centre for Foundation Studies in Science, University of Malaya from 2015-2016. She is currently a third year degree student in Bachelor of Applied Science Material Technology. She is a Dean Lee student of Faculty Bio engineering and technology for every semester. So she is an active student in university and has joined a few debate competitions such as Debat Belia 2018 held in UM, UKM and also Debat A Star in University Malaya. It, she is now working on her final year project in tissue engineering field. So Miss Siti Hajar, the floor is yours now. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning I bid to all members of the flock. Today I would like to give a lecture on two-step solvent evaporation, a cost-effective preparation of holocolidosomes in biomaterials technology. Before I proceed, my name is Siti Hajar Biti Zaid Amri. I am from Faculty of Bioengineering and Technology, University of Malaysia, Kelantan. As I am the first presenter for today's lecture, I would like to ask each and every one of you to focus and meet and please do not sleep in my lecture. So let's go through one by one on the lecture's outline for today's lecture. So the first thing I will talk about on what is a holocolidosome and then I will talk about the preparation methods on how we can prepare the holocolidosomes and then I will go in details on the preparation of polyhydroxybutyrate as the polymer in preparation of the colidosomes and then I will talk about the results and findings in the study and also the contribution to discipline or the applications of the colidosome itself and then last but not least I will conclude today's lecture in the summary part now before I explain to you on what is a holocolidosomes. Let me ask you a question. Is there anyone here who does not know what is a capsule? A capsule. So please raise your hand if you don't know what is a capsule. So I bet everyone knows what is a capsule because I'm pretty sure everyone here knows a capsule like this and have taken a capsule like this before. So this one is a regular type of capsules which denoted as size zero. It has length of 20 millimeter or 2 centimeter 
and it can contain drugs from 400 milligrams up until 600 milligrams. So just imagine this regular type of capsules that you've taken before, but in much smaller in size, which we're talking about micro capsules. So the range of size for micro capsules are from a 15 nanometer up until 2 millimeter. So mind you that this micro capsules that I compare with the regular type of capsules it is actually have the range maximum range of size that a micro capsules can be. So what exactly is a micro capsules? Now micro capsules, let me explain to you what is a micro capsules. So micro capsules is basically a sphere with the outer layer denoted as shells that includes the inner layer that denoted as core. So the core we leave it as hollow for the encapsulation process to happen. So what is encapsulation process? Encapsulation process is where we encapsulate active ingredients in the core and enclose it with the shells. So now we know this one is one type of microcapsules. Let's take another look at the second type of microcapsules, which is what we call as holocolidosomes. So the holocolidosomes, the shell parts consist of a closed pack layer of colloidal particles that enclose the core layer, which is the inner layer of these microcapsules. So microcapsules can be in form of this one, which has the smooth surface where we call it as hollow particles, and it can be in form of this one, which has the shells made up from the colloidal particles, where we call this one as holocolidosomes. Now we know what is a holocolidosomes. Let's take a look at the preparation methods on how we can prepare the holocolidosomes. So there are several methods on how we can prepare them. So the first method is pickering emulsion. So what is pickering emulsion method? Pickering emulsion method is basically a method where emulsion is stabilized by solid particles. Ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look at this diagram in front of you. So we can roughly conclude that this diagram consists of two many steps on how we can prepare the holocolidosomes. Now let me explain to you in general, which is the upper part of the diagram from here up until here is just for us to synthesize the solid particles. So once the solid particles is synthesized, we disperse it in water to create a water phase. We mix it with all phase, homogenize it at high speed rate, and then undergo the rotary evaporator to eliminate the oil phase in the solvents and then only then we can obtain the holocolidosomes. So such a long process on how we can obtain the holocolidosomes, isn't it? So now let's take a look at the second method on how we can prepare these holocolidosomes which is layer by layer method. So in general, layer by layer method involves the absorption of anionic and cationic polyelectrolyte onto a template. And after we the layered template will then be reinforced with the solid microparticles and then more layering is done to bind and hold the solid microparticles together. And at the end of the process, we have to remove the template to leave the core as a hollow so that we can obtain the holocolidosomes. So this method is basically quite complicated, especially on the layering part. And then we have to remove the template at the end of the process. So now we know both methods on how we can prepare the holocolidosomes. Now let's take a look at the drawbacks of the methods I explained before, which is for pickering emotions, it actually has too many steps involved. This we can conclude from the diagram I've showed you before. And then if there are many steps involved in a method, it is a time consuming method. If a method consumes time, then it, can, it consumes money as well. So this goes as well for the layer by layer method which is layer by layer method is also a time consuming method because it consumes time because of too many steps involved especially on the layering part and then it is it is a waste full of materials why i say so because at the end of the process we have to remove the template either by calcination or dissolution in organic solvents so ladies and gentlemen as a human we want things to be fast cheap and simple so how to encounter these methods that actually consumes time, consumes money, and it's a long process on how we can prepare the holocolidosomes. Now, let me introduce you the highlight of today's lecture, which is the two steps solvent evaporation method. So if we would like to compare this diagram with the diagram before I've shown you in the Pickering emotion part, this diagram is clearly much simpler, right?
Yes. Yes. Okay. So let me introduce you on the two steps of evaporation method, which is this first step. We prepare the water phase and then we prepare the off phase. We mix it, homogenize it at high speed rate. However, the way we introduce the oil phase into the water phase is by feeding process. What is feeding process? Feeding process is we injecting oil phase into the water phase by using the syringe pump so that we can control and fix the rate of injection of the oil phase into the water phase. So after we homogenize it, we create an emulsion and then the emulsion goes into the rotary evaporator to eliminate the solvents and the oil phase and then we can obtain the holocolodosomes right there and then straight away the holocolodosomes can be obtained. So this method of two steps of an evaporation is much simpler, is faster and also is cheaper to be compared with the Pickering emulsion <coughs> method and also layer by layer method. So now let's go in details on the two steps of an evaporation method where we produce the polyhydroxybutyrate holocolodosomes. So the first step is we actually prepare the oil phase by using polyhydroxybutyrate. We dissolve it in chloroform solution. And then we prepare the water phase by using polyvinyl alcohol. We prepare it in water. And then we homogenize it to create an emulsion. And then this is where the feeding process happens, where we actually inject oil phase into the water phase by the switch pump. And then after we create an emulsion, we undergo the rotary evaporator to eliminate the oil phase and the solvents. And then we can obtain the holocolodosomes. So the holocolodosomes obtained, we did a characterization task on the optical microscope and also scanning electron microscope. But for today's lecture, I will focus and emphasize on the results of scanning electron microscopes because it actually offers a better resolution in terms of morphology. Now let's take a look at the results and the findings of this study. Which is we have a few samples here. For the first sample, we produce PHB, polyhydroxybutyrate, PVA, polyvinyl alcohol, at 1.2% of PVA concentration. So what happened, we can view the image at B. The morphology shown by the sample is actually it has high porosity. So if we would like to compare with the second sample, which is PHB, PVA, at 0.58% of PVA concentration, which has slightly lower concentration of PVA, we can view that this image is actually, a, the morphology shown that it has a lower porosity to be compared with the first sample. So now let's take a look at the third sample, which we're using polycaprolactone, PCL, PVA at 1.28% of PVA concentration. We're using a different types of biomaterials where we're using this PCL, but at the same concentration of PVA with the first sample. So we can observe here at F, the morphology of this sample is shown a smooth surface and then it has lower porosity to be compared with the first sample at the same concentration of PVA. Now, how does this happen? We have seen this diagram before, but in this part, I will emphasize on the feeding process. So what happened during the feeding process is we injecting all phase to water phase and then we create a droplet of emulsion. So after some time, the one that being fed first will leave us a smaller emulsion size and the one that being fed later will leave us a larger emulsion size. So what happened here is the smaller emulsion size will adhere to the larger emulsion size due to the hydrophobicity properties. So now after we get this type of emulsion, we undergo the rotary evaporator and then we can get the holocolodosomes. So this one is actually the end product of the two steps of an evaporation, which is this one is a holocolodosome. So now this is how the holocolodosomes obtained from the two steps of an evaporation. Now we know what is a holocolodosomes and how to prepare them by using pickering motion, it can prepare by using the layer by layer method and also this two steps of an evaporation method. Now let's take a look at the contribution to discipline or the applications of the holocolodosome itself. I bet everyone is here is wondering why do we need to prepare the holocolodosome itself? So, the first application of this holocolodosomes is for the delivery of active ingredients where we can control the release of active ingredients for the targeted application which is it can be applied in medicine field which is for the drug delivery system and for fragrances, cosmeceutical and also agriculture field. And the second application is for the tissue engineering where it can be used for scaffolds 
So what is the scaffolds? Scaffolds is actually it mimics the extracellular matrix and it helps in the regeneration of tissues. It helps the tissue to grow. And then this is a scaffold, the type, uh, example of a scaffold. So what is the main requirements for scaffold? Scaffold should be high porosity because it would like to aid the tissues to regenerate and to grow. So let's compare the morphology of the studies I've shown before with this contribution to this page or the applications where it appropriate morphology can be used, which is for the delivery of active ingredients, we can compare this PHBPVA at 0.58% of PVA concentration morphology with PCLPVA at 1.28% of PVA morphology. These are the examples that the morphology that can be used for the delivery of the active ingredients. Why? Because it shows less porosity in terms of the morphology and it can be used for a better encapsulation process. So now for the tissue engineering where we use it as a scaffold, we, the main requirements for scaffold is it should be highly porous. So this morphology of PHBPB at 1.28% of PVA concentration, it actually uh, offers a high porosity in terms of morphology and it meets the requirement of the scaffold itself. Now we know what is the holocolidosomes and also we know how to prepare them. And also now we already know what the applications that suits the holocolidosomes. We have come to the end of the lecture. So I will conclude today's lecture in the summary part, which is the first uh, point is two steps of evaporation. It's uh, actually a cost-effective method to be compared with the methods like pickering motion and layer by layer. And it is less time-consuming and also it is applicable for larger scale. When we're talking about larger scale of production, we have to consider about the production time as well as the production cost. So these two steps of an evaporation method is basically applicable to be proposed for a larger scale of production. And then the second point is different morphology in terms of porosity of the colloidosomes actually offer different types of applications. So it doesn't matter if we prepare the high porosity or a lower porosity in terms of the morphology of holocolidosomes, both can be fit into a different types of applications. So the third point is holocolidosomes can be developed more, especially for biomedical applications, where we can control the release of the drugs into our body. So that's all from me for today's lecture. With that, I thank you. and holoparticles and uh, what is the advantage using holocolidisms in the various applications instead of uh, holoparticles? Oh, thank you for the question. So you're asking me what is the difference between the holoparticles and the holocolidisms itself. So both are a type of microcapsules but uh, the first difference that we can observe here is the one from the shell, uh, the shell structure. Sorry. So holo for holoparticles it has a shell structure structure which has the smooth surface and for the holocolidosomes it has colloidal particles made up of the shells so what is the advantages of the holocolidosomes that we're using instead of the holoparticles so there are a few properties that we can alter that we can control by using the holocolidosomes instead of the holoparticles for the first one is for mechanical properties also, we can control the permeability and also the flexibility. In terms of medical properties, mechanical properties, we can actually alter the mechanical properties by altering, controlling the size of the colloidal particles that made up the shells. So, if we, uh, it is uh, according to the targeted application that we would like. So, mechanical properties depend on the targeted application. So, if we want to fabricate a uh, high mechanical properties of colloidosomes, we, sh uh, we can alter it by the controlling the size. And for the permeability, this one, colloidal particles, it should have the pores. Colloidal particles made up of pores. They have pores, interconnecting pores between the colloidal particles. So we can actually alter the size of pores by having the high packing density or lower the packing.
university. If you want to have a lower type, so lower size of course, and allows, hello, and allows high permeability, so we can lower the packing density. But if you want to have a lower, lower, uh, lower permeability in terms of permeability, we can fabricate the holoclodosomes with higher, uh, with lower. No, I'm sorry, with higher packing density. If we want low permeability, high packing density. So that the size of the uh, uh, size of the pores is smaller. So it has a lower permeability. And for the flexibility, we can use it flexible into the, our targeted applications. So this one can be used in various types of applications. And we can encapsulate a various in active ingredients. It doesn't matter solid, liquid or gas. We can encapsulate any active ingredients accordingly to our targeted application. So I think that answers your question. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Yes. Okay. Um, very good presentation. And um, I today at least I know about what is the polypolyism that you mentioned to us. Okay. Uh, it is uh, one question to ask you related to the, the sample that you gather. There oh, are yes. three types of sample yes. show to us, isn't it? Yes. How do you obtain in terms of uh, design of experiment that you conduct to achieve this? You mean the formulation of yes. the samples? So actually this one is a preliminary study, just a preliminary study. So we actually propose a few formulations in terms of the concentration of PVA where actually we varies the PVA concentration which we denoted as high concentration using 1.28% and for the lower concentration we are uh, using 0.58%. So we actually propose like a few uh, samples, a few formulation for a few samples that we would like to know the effects of the concentration of the surfactant itself. But to, uh, in this study we have not yet found the Optimum, uh, optimum population that we can see that this is the best uh, type of colodosomes uh, that uh, can be produced. This is the best formulation for types of uh, this one, or, or this is one is the best one. So we cannot say that this is the best. It is not. We still have yet to prove the optimization of the formulation, but this one is what we propose in our study. So, uh, yes. We uh, actually come with a few based on the readings on the journals on how we can prepare the colodosomes by using the two steps of evaporation. So we actually just propose a few formulation that uh, we get a thing that can fit and can produce uh, types of uh, colodosomes. So this actually happens by try and error formulation. So uh, yes, we have not yet found the correct formulation because this one is just preliminary study. We have to uh, two weeks further for further studies. So I think that is the answer question. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Um, good morning, VCT. Selamat Yeah, I noted with very interest that uh, the steps are very much, uh, the steps to do, to produce this uh, holo holodism is being reduced to just two steps. Okay. Yes. Now, in real life practical for this to be produced in the factory how do you think that the quality control or rather the qaqc needs to do how do you maintain the qaqc because actually you are from five six steps jump into two steps as far as the qaqc is concerned how do you foresee this in future let's say this is going to be mass produced in the factory okay thank you uh, so, uh Hello? Hello? Okay. So uh, you are asking if, uh, about the quality. Is it the same as the one that yes. we used right. uh, before? With, okay. To be compared, the, actually two steps of evaporation. We've produced the holocolodosomes. The quality of the product of the holocolodosome itself. Actually, we can say it uh, as uh, same as the Pickering motions and layer by layer method, which has the long process of it. But in this, uh, we have like this pro and cons every steps every method we have pro and cons so actually uh for these steps the cons of this step is uh in my study we actually uh can conclude that these two steps of evaporation is uh they have a high dispersity index so uh 
compared to the Pickering emulsion and also the layer by layer method, they have a low dispersity index and they have they can produce high yield of colloidosomes. But in this uh, study, we figure out that this two step solvent evaporation actually have a lower yield due to the high dispersity index. However, we believe that if we found the correct formulation in terms of how the rate of injection of the oil phase into the water phase and also the oil to water phase ratio, if we can find the correct formulation and optimization, we can actually uh, fight the cons of this two steps of an evaporation method due to the high dispersity index because we uh, do because I explained just now about this one with uh, the first bean fat will evaporate first and the one that later bean fat will have not much time to evaporate so uh, this one the formulation the process of this one the, what happened during the feeding process the one, uh, this one we can alter the formulation of the feeding process so that it has the, the balanced yield so that if the proportion if the proportion of this larger one to eight for example eight uh, smaller emulsion should bind to the one larger size so uh, we should find the correct formulation so that it will uh, find it will be the correct formulation for the holocolodosomes to happen so that's why we still try an error of how much we injecting oil phase into the water phase we try and error the injecting uh, rate but if we found the correct or optimum rate, so that we can find the solution to the problems of the high dispersity index. But basically, the holocolodosome produced is the same as the holocolodosome produced for the Pickering emulsion and also the layer by layer. Just that we found the, the another shortcut to the method, so that we can cut it to the two steps of the method. Yeah, that's my concern. Normally, um, shortcut is uh, risky. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. You answered my question. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much to Miss Siti Hajar binti Zaid Amri, who is from University of Malaysia, Kelantan. And now, I would like to invite our second finalist, Siti, Miss Siti Zubaida Patuan from UMS, University of Malaysia, Sabah. Before she uh, go through her lecture, let me introduce herself. Uh, introduce herself. Siti Zubaida Binti Patuan has received her Bachelor of Science and a Master in Industrial Chemistry at University, University of Malaysia Sabah in 2018. She knows what truly really drives a research and it's not about mastering the work, it's how well you evolve your understanding that is parallel with the concept. Now, please, take the floor. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning. Okay, thank you. So, uh, before I started with my lecture, we sh should start with a story. Since we are nearing to the Ramadan, actually a lady is preparing a month earlier. Uh, can you please imagine you have, a, you have a beautiful garments and you send for a tailor. But somehow a week before Hari Raya, your wife or even you found that clothes that you wanted to wear did not following the way you wanted. Somehow the measurement is off. How do you feel? Upset. Definitely, because I do. And some of us, we take decisions we're not going to wear that clothes because that clothes is no longer fit the way we want. And some of, in a technical terms, we call it as a faulty. So in materials world, it happens. We seldom overlook a faulty materials, but lesser that we know that these floor materials of faulty materials is actually the materials that we want in order to fix or even to solve our certain problems. So ladies and gentlemen, for two days, I would like to share a few knowledge about clay-based zeolite, a faulty zeolite that high potentials for industrial applications. Right? So far so good? Cool? All right. Nice. So for today's presentations, you will at least be answer these a few questions. First is what is zeolite? And when you know about zeolite, you need to know how to synthesize it. And what are the applications and potentials of these materials? And finally, what are the contributions of this research, especially these materials? So first, is I want to introduce you what is zeolite. Before you are knowing about zeolite, we should understand the mother term of zeolite. So zeolite has been introduced in early 1790 by the Swedish mineralogists during the volcanic eruptions. 
the scientists found out that certain particular areas have a clean air. And through an extensive research, they found that the, part, the materials that act as a purifying the air is like spongy-like materials. In Greek terms, call it a boiler rock. So boiler rock in Greek is a zeolite of minerals. Okay, since they found out this zeolite can have a potential of applications, they wanted more, but it's limited because we cannot wait for volcano like every day. So since even they have a volcano during that times, each and every volcano will giving them a different types of minerals, different composition, different uh, concern, concentrations. So after that, the scientists come out with the idea, why don't we copy original, this natural occurring zeolite? into a synthetic zoolite. And over the past few years, there have been over 176 types of synthetic zoolite, and one of them is zoolite tea. So zoolite tea is quite different, because like any other, unlike any other of zoolite, a synthetic zoolite copy original one terms. But for zoolite tea, they have a two. And what is that? It's a combination between free type and also ironite in Sorry, in one system, okay, it's mainly made up from silica and also alumina. To make it much more, um, to make you much more understand, imagine ophritite is a clothes and also the uranite is a pants. So whenever, whenever clothes and pants meet together, they come up with the new fashions. A jumpsuit. So after this, whenever you found a lady wearing a jumpsuit, make it much more technical, say, it, hey, she's wearing a zeolite tea. Because zeolite tea, <laughs> yes, combinations of both, of fritite and uranite. Okay, because of the staking of ofritite and uranite, it's giving a zeolite tea a special characteristics. Because zeolite is very popular with the voids, so a combination of ofritite and unite giving a zeolite multiple of voids, different types of pores. And this is an excellent characteristic to be able as an excellent molecular siever. So then, you already know about how to synthesize, uh, you don't know what is zeolite Let's learn how to synthesize it. I can summarize you, even a housewife can do a zeolite at home if you have the ingredients. <laughs> All right. First thing says, zeolite is made up from silica and alumina. You need to have the ingredient of silica to alumina. Throughout the past few years, to the best of our knowledge, all the researchers actually using independent chemicals, which is pure chemicals, as you can see on a listed table. Except in the 2013 by Bora, they're actually uh, making a new alternative by using RHA. RHA is a rice hash ash. And for your information, it's the uh, materials uh, act as a source of silica. But then, it's only a source of silica. To the best of our knowledge, none of the researchers actually using one material that consists both silica and alumina, except our team. So, because of the tremendous attention to what molecular sieve, they wanted uh, to synthesi synthesize more of these materials by using economic and much more cost, uh, safe cost. So, what my materials I'm using as a raw ingredient is a clay. Because the clay is a very raw versatile in its on your powder form. For ancients, uh, for before this, we actually yes, um, when you mention about clay, we're imagining they're making a beautiful pottery. But do you know that these materials also can giving us the advancement of technology? And now I'm going to show you how. This is our my, this is our sample, a, a nano size of zeolite made up especially from a clay itself. Okay. All you need to do, have a good, complete composition in order to tune up the silica alumina ratio in the clay. So this is my uh, chemical composition. And let's see how. First, I have the kaolin put inside the Teflon bottle. I introduce the alkaline activator, which is sodium or potassium, and allow the chemical reaction to have on a 24-hour aging at room temperature and after that, I put my sample into an oven for hydrothermal. And after the elevated time, I filter my sample, dry it up, and go further for the characterizations. And since this is an inorganic chemistry, the, in, the um, characterization space will be held by using XRD. 
This will be the XRD patterns for our sample from a zeolite tea. As you can see, on the morphology, we have a raw crystals of zeolite tea with small particles of a zeolite L and quartz. For optimizations of the uh, formula, we need to ensure that the samples only held by zeolite tea. Since we have a zeolite L and quartz, we need to remove it. Can we remove it? Yes, we do. I answered it for you. By marrying the organic and the inorganic, I'm introducing organic structure directing agents called tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide as a template in order to help the crystallizations of zeolite T by surpassing the threshold value of zeolite L. But there is a catch. Before characterizations of your product at the stage 5, we need to remove the organic template by calcining up to 500 degrees Celsius. And do our sample change after 500 calcinations? No. That's not changing because zeolite tea is a high resistance towards temperature. Only the organics, uh, only the organic template we're going to burn out. Let's see for the XRD patterns. Ta -da! Okay, previously we have zeolite L. For now, after the introductions of TMA, we have all the samples with a pure form of zeolite T. As you can see on the morphology on the left side, this, this one is the morpho uh, pure morphology of zeolite tea in a nano size. All right, we know how to synthesize. We need to know what is the application. Since the zeolite tea has been a major peak, but they did not uh, synthesize from a clay, we have the multiple of applications zeolite tea has been established during uh, uh, extensive research. And I would like to share to you, one of them is extensions for distillations. Because for, in order to distill, uh, uh, separate these two materials and uh, these two mixture when they have a close boiling point they cannot separate more but by using as gelati as a membrane to separate it we're able to separate more of the close boiling point which is the azeotropic via per evaporation process and not only that it can since the zeolite have a free cations which is a sodium and potassium within its voids it can act as the ion exchanger to trap the heavy metal to trap the heavy metal by using the ion exchange with the cation. And the most recently and have been the major attentions is zeolite as a molecular sieve because of the voids and the size of the void is very suitable for the size of carbon dioxide it able to trap and separate carbon dioxide from a natural gas. And this has been the major attentions before. And why is that? They found out even in a different temperature up from 35 degrees Celsius up to 200 degrees Celsius, the permeability and also the selectivity of zeolite T still choose carbon dioxide over the hydrocarbon. So in hydrocarbon, in uh, natural gas applications, they want this kind of uh, siever, this kind of material in order to separate the carbon dioxide from the natural gas. All right. That's what I say. The voids and also the pores of zeolite T is very suitable to trap and separate carbon dioxide <coughs> because of the size as 0.36 up to 0.33. Even the methane 0.38 can, can uh, go through with our uh, zeolite tea, but it will never pass through, this, through the zeolite tea. And we jump to the fourth section, which is what are the contributions of this sample. First, we make it this far. When you look at this picture, what will you see? Oil and gas terminal. And in technical sense, they say it's, it's upstream. Okay, oil and gas having they actually uh, facing a few uh, problems, which is facing a corrosion of pipeline because a certain uh, terminal they have different concentrations of carbon dioxide or H2S on a sample uh, on the natural gas. So the high concentrations of CO2 is denoted as a sour gas, and high CO2 is very corrosive. And they're always facing a problem in the corrosive pipeline. Okay, when I can say about this, CO2 can trap carbon dioxide. It can be as alternative way to actually uh, apply on the upstream to separate the carbon dioxide. If the concern is about high temperature, believe me, zeolite tea is high resistance to temperature. And if we say about upstream is too big, why don't we jump a little bit for downstream? This is the carbon dioxide stripper plant for urea plant. They're using this plant, uh, using the MDR, which is a polymer, to separate and to trap the carbon dioxide via chemical reaction, which is chemisorption. And they're using is uh, using this to 
take out the CO2 from uh, natural gas and using the CO2 to synthesize to make a uh, urea. But however, for the MDR itself, for the lean, it needs um, still a small amount of carbon dioxide in it in order to absorb more after that and also to prevent the MDR from undergoing reaction with the H2S. And once again, CO2 can be an alternative. We, it can separate the carbon dioxide not only use not through chemist options but using a physics options. At high temperature resistance, and what about the cost? Since we able to synthesize gelati from a clay. I bet we can cut a few costs on it, right? So, it's not only for the marketability of this product, it's also for the sustainability. I can share to you, in Sabah, we have potentials of mining and also growth of economy for kaolin. We have plenty full of kaolin, kaolin mine. It can be used for our econo economic growth. And not only for Sabah, since I'm from Borneo, I'm going to share from... Sarawak also. Also, we have a few of potential industries for clay to act as our raw, uh, providing our raw materials in order to synthesize zeolite from a clay. Therefore, uh, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I will jump to the conclusions, which is going to answer the questions on the first slide. What is zeolite? Zeolite is the intergrowth of faulty materials of retite in your night. Remember the jumpsuit, okay? Remember jump, uh, zeolite. And after that, how to synthesize it? You can synthesize a zeolite as long as you have silica and alumina. But for this lecture, we know that from a clay, we can have this excellent molecular sieve. Applications potentials for the uh, zeolite, CO2 absorber, heavy metal trapper, and also azeotropic separator for the extensions of distillations. And finally, for the contributions, economic growth, we can provide our eco economy for our country. Marketability of products, since we have the industries that are using a molecular sieve and sustainable, sustainable of raw materials. So this, I'm, um, we, as a, from a team of zeolite, actually, we can use this material. We have a good research for this. Why don't we use it, make it more, and be the pioneers of our industry? It's all from me. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Siti Zubaida. The second city for today. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and we'll be the last city. city. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, uh, let's start with I.R. William first. Okay. Yeah. Hey, good morning. Selamat pagi, Siti the second. Yeah, morning. Definitely not the last. La. <laughs> you want to come out first today, right? Okay. Um, as uh, with other materials that you have find. Now, this material, of course, you focus on all the advantages. Uh. Do you actually study the drawbacks? Any drawbacks being done? Yes. Uh, can you share with me? Okay. Oh, can you share with us? Thank you very much. Because the draw, uh, for the zeolite, you have in a uh, powder form. Okay, for the uh, extensions of the applications, uh, for example, if we are, uh, what do you say, compare, in a liquid and also solid small particles, it's difficult to have it back because the solid particles, right? For the applications, it's difficult to gain it back. From one state to another. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, you put your sample in a CO2 absorber, okay. and right because it's in a powder form, okay. and after the application, you won't gain hundred percent gram of your sample oh. after yes. Uses to heat or uh, heat isotherm heat or pressure. So that means uh, zeolite. Okay, uh, Yes. Okay, I think you come up with uh, some novel approach, according to what you said to us uh, in the beginning of the presentation. Yes. That uh, based on the literature, the past studies, yes. uh, that uh, no one done this from a clay. On, from the clay, yeah. yeah. Um, but that's not my question, so I'm not going to investigate on that. Oh, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but my question is here. Um, it's on uh, synthesis method. Mm -hmm. um, how do you determine the composition uh, amount? And then you come up with the formula, I think. Yes. Yeah. Uh, to form uh, zeolite from the yeah. yeah. I mean, how, uh, how I'm able to have the formulations? Yeah, you determine the composition, the amount. Amount of? 
amount of mixing. Amount of mixing. Yeah. Uh, because re these things have been optimized, before this, I have plenty full of chemical compositions. You did the optimization, is it? Yes, I did the optimization. I have a list How do you carry out, is it? Hmm? How do you carry out? Can you share with us? Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> yeah. um, you mean from uh, the How do you come up with the design of experiment? This is what I mean. Uh, because for this, like, they have their own uh, formula. I mean, how my, uh, the cation in six. So all you, you need to know how many ratios, how much of the ratio that you need for the sodium, for the potassium, and also for the, especially for silica and alumina. So whenever you have uh, uh, calculate the ratios between silica and alumina, and you need to alter your raw ingredients. And altering it's much more difficult because you need to try and error. Yes. Yes, 0 0.02, even the 0 0.01 to 0 0.02 have a different product. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Siti Zubaida. Yes. Um, it, it's a good uh, presentation and you make me have a headache to understand it mm. at the first beginning because, uh, yeah, uh, this is the first time for me to know about the, the zero line. And uh, I would like to know about the, the uh, description of the, um, the meaning of the faulty. Faulty, uh, why is it faulty? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, how uh, it become if it's not a faulty uh, material from uh, some studies? Uh, because last time, uh, on the very beginning of, thank you, okay. On the very beginning of the slide, I'm saying that the researcher found a zeolite from a volcano. So they wanted more. And during that time, the idea is only waiting for the volcano eruptions. But then when they study, they know that the molecular structures of the voids, all the cages is made up from silica and alumina, bonded by the oxygen. So they come with the idea, okay, copy original what we want. And during, uh, during that time, they found it's ophritite and uranite, both uh, different types of natural occurring isolate. So they want to synthesize this too. But however, whenever they want to synthesize ophritite, they still uranite stack in. They want to synthesize uranite, they have operated state in. So the researcher don't know how to label the synthetic. Either it's operated following the natural, or uranite also following, but it cannot because they have combination of both. So that's why we come up, they say that, okay, these two operated uranite cannot be synthesized separately. So they call it as a faulty because they cannot be in a pure form of operated or in a pure form of uranite. Okay, is it okay? <laughs> Thank you very much. Yay, thank you. Right, thank you very much. Please give a big round of applause to our contestant. Now, uh, without further ado, I would like to call Mr. Tan Yong Chi. Uh, he's ready now. Mr. Tan is currently pursuing his PhD study under the supervision of Professor Dr. Abdul Rahim Muhammad Yusuf, starting from October 2017. His PhD study, which focuses on the fabrication of nanofiber using electro spinning technique for skin tissue engineering. Uh, Tan also represented. Uh, he, uh, he's also uh, has re represented Malaysian in an international Chinese debate competition in Taiwan in 2014. Uh, so, Mr. Tan, right, security alert. Okay, you are ready. The floor is yours now. All the best. Okay. I think you can use this mic. Testing. I still remember when I was small, I started using plaster whenever I have a cut on my finger. The reason behind it is not because the plaster used to be very expensive. No, it's because the material they used to produce the plaster make it very hard to be removed and sticky. And most of the times, it is so painful during the removing process. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that many of us have this kind of experience before, right? So now, we are very lucky we have a plaster that can be easily to be removed. But no matter how easy it is, the removing process creates a certain degree of new damage to the wound. Therefore, plaster is not suitable for patients who experience the extensive skin loss. 
Size bird. Ladies and gentlemen, warning, the following diagram may make you feel uncomfortable. When we talk about burn, sorry, when we talk about burn, it is a kind of injury to the skin caused by heat, radiation, friction, or direct contact to chemical. Globally, it is one of the most serious health issues because it costs us 180,000 deaths annually. Although now we have a treatment called skin grafting that can be used for patients who are suffering from burns, the, the treatment still poses a lot of limitations, particularly the lack of suitable tissue supply. That, ladies and gentlemen, I will discuss the problem in more details later. Furthermore, the patients also face a risk of bacterial infection during the treatment. As a result, my team think about why don't we prepare an artificial skin tissue, scalpel, with antibacterial activity to solve the problem. And this is how this project come up. A very good morning to the distinguished judges and audience. I am Tan Yong Chi from University of Technology Malaysia. Today, I would like to give a lecture entitled Fabrication and Characterization of Electrospan, Polyvinyl Alcohol, Polycarbonaton, Kytosan, Brandon Nanofiber Scaffold for Skin Tissue Regeneration. The title seems very long and complicated, right? Yes. yes. In fact, it can be simplified into five important keywords, which is Electrospan comes from the word electrospinning, the machine that I use to produce my product. Polyvinyl alcohol, polycarbonaton, kytosan are three different ingredients that are used in this project. And scaffold is my product, my material. So let us start my lecture today with electrospinning. Ladies and gentlemen, the term electrospinning is a combination of two ideas. Electro comes from the word electrostatic force and spinning, a spinning technique, a technique that we use to change the structure of material into fiber form. So how to combine these two ideas into one and why we need electro spinning? I will answer the questions later. But before that, let us think about another question. Why we need spinning technique? In other words, why we need to change the structure of material into fiber form? Can they make our life much better? I think we can find this answer by looking at this wonderful thing called a candy. It used to be my favorite before. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, do you know that the process of producing cotton candy actually involves spinning technique? First, we need a sugar solution, and then we transfer it into a spinning machine. So in that machine, the solution is injected to the surrounding, and once this liquid jet is solidified, they become the fiber structure of sugar. So this is how we produce a cotton candy, and it's very interesting that your child will ask you to buy the cotton candy for them as snack, but they never ask you to buy a pack of sugar. Why? They are the same thing, right? This is because when we change the structure of material into fiber form, what we actually do is that we increase the surface area of the material, and this increases the interaction between the sugar molecule and our tongue. And that is the reason your child will feel that color candy tastes much more delicious and fluffy. So, in short, by changing the structure of material into fiber forms, we can enhance the application of that material. So, send application, send Advantages is applied in electrospinning as well. In electrospinning, due to the use of electrostatic force, we can create much smaller liquid jack that eventually produce very fine fibers with diameter for the range of micrometer and even nanometer. And ladies and gentlemen, a good news. The smaller the fiber, the larger the surface area, and we can further enhance the application of that material. Additionally, by manipulating the operational parameter for electrospinning, we can produce many kinds of fiber. For example, you can produce smooth fiber as shown in the green box, or porous fibers as shown in the red box. This property is vital important, especially in biomedical application, because our body tissue is made of different kinds of fiber structure. For example, in the case of skin tissue regeneration, we prefer using smooth fiber because this kind of fibers mimic the extracellular metric of our skin, which is shown in the blue box. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the electrospin fiber mat that we usually can obtain for electrospinning. To that, electrospin fiber mat have been widely used in many applications. They have been used as a filter for air filtration or wastewater treatment. They also have been used as a sensor for chemical detection. But my group put more focus on the chemical, sorry, bio, medical application. 
what you're going to use it as a scar for for skin tissue regeneration. So how does it work? The idea of scar for is quite similar to the plaster, but the difference is that scar for can degrade itself. In other words, we no need to remove it after a treatment. So in order to achieve this property, we use two biodegradable polymers, polyvinyl alcohol (PVA) and polycarbonylaton (PCR). These two polymers are common polymers they use in biomedical application and have been approved by U.S. Food and Drug Administration (FDA). We need PVA in this project is because the hydrophilic polymer has active sites to increase cell attachment and proliferation. Nonetheless, hydrophilic, hydrophilic polymer to, tend to be very unstable when in contact to water. As a result, I bring PCL, a hydrophobic polymer to solve the problems, meanwhile to increase the tensile strength. We choose electro spinning over the other technique to produce our scarpo, is because the electro spun nanofiber mat, as I mentioned just now, mimic the extracellular matrix or our skin, so the cells will feel that they are at home and happy to grow. Additionally, the structure also can prevent bacteria penetration effectively due to the small pore. However, it cannot prevent bacteria growing on top of my scaffold. As a result, I ran Kytosan, a natural antibacterial agent to inhibit the growth of bacteria. So what is Kytosan? It is very toxic. If it can kill bacteria, can it kill us as well? The answer is not. Kytosan is one of the most abundant polysaccharides that can be found in nature and can be synthesized safely from Cretosia size crabs. Okay, up to here you may ask me a question. Tan, why you need to spend your time to prepare artificial skin tissue, scalpel? In fact, we can get the grafting on tissue from the nature, right? Yes, and the treatment is called skin grafting. Basically, there are four types of skin grafting depending on the material we use to replace the extensive skin loss. Autograft, the patient get the grafting on tissue for its other part of the body. Isograft, get it from between. This two treatment is highly recommended because the genetically identical tissue reduce the risk of graft rejection. Nonetheless, their supply is very limited and not all the people going to treat brother and sister, right? So later on, people think about, why don't we get the grafting of tissue from other people, allograft, or from other species, xenograft? Yes, these two treatments solve the problem of supply, but the genetically non-identical tissue increase the risk of graft rejection. And no matter which treatment you are choosing, they pose a risk of disease transmission because we are transferring cells and tissue from one organism to another. Additionally, they also pose a risk of post-surgical enhancements in which the patient has to go through the secondary surgery after the treatment. And this increases the scar formation and infection, which we don't want. Okay, so now is the more exciting part. I'm going to show you how I produce my product. As I mentioned many times previously, I use electro spinning. It is a spinning technique they're using electrostatic force to produce ultra-fine fiber. Electrospinning is considered as one of the simple techniques because it typically set up only consists of three major components. A feeding unit, I use shrimp pump in my lab, a high voltage supply, and a collector. The collector should connect it to the ground step for safety purpose. So similar to the conventional spinning technique, we need to prepare polymer solution before electrospinning. And after that, I will transfer it into a string and use string band to control the feed rate. So this is my project. It seems very simple, right? Prepare the solution, get a fiber, study it, and I can get my PhD. No. If you observe carefully, you'll find out that the most challenging part in my project is that how to combine PVA, PCR, and Kytosan into one solution, since their relationship is like oil and water. And we don't want to use any extra chemical for it because it may increase the cost of production and cytotoxicity. As a result, I spent one semester to study many kinds of solvent system and eventually I count a formulation that can combine everything into one, homogeneously, without using any surfactant or emulsifier. So now I'm going to show you how I prepare the solution. I fixed the concentration of PVA and PCL in 20 and 50% respectively, and after that, I adding them with ratio one to one. Due to the good solution formulation, they combine homogeneously, as shown in the slide. And then, I will add a different amount of kytosan, 0 by 1, oh, sorry, 1%, 2%, 3%, and 4%. We try to cut down the amount of kytosan used in this project, 
because this material can increase the solution viscosity they eventually reduce the electron spinability. So after I get my product, I will immediately study their antibacterial activity using this diffusion test, DDT. It is a very simple antibacterial assay. We prepare the agar in the pantry disc and then spread the bacteria and put a sample of it. So if the sample of my product can inhibit the growth of bacteria, it will show an inhibitory zone, this one, after one night incubation. So in this project, I studied, I tested two different kinds of bacteria, which is s arrows gram-positive bacteria, and E. coli, gram-negative bacteria. So this is the result. Okay, so this is a sample. Okay, this is a sample. So as you can observe, although all my products contain chitosan, but it doesn't guarantee that it can inhibit the growth of bacteria. My product can only inhibit the growth of bacteria when the amount of chitosan reaches 3%. So in later chemical characterization, we are only focused on this product because as I mentioned earlier, we want our scarfo to inhibit the growth of bacteria. So this is a fission image of my sample, this one. I compare them with my another product, PVA PCL. So as you can observe, their fiber diameter is almost similar, around 150 nanometer. But after adding chitosan, because the solution viscosity has been increased, increased, therefore the fiber starts to form branch during the electro spinning. And actually, we prefer this kind of structure because it's more similar to our extracellular matrix or our, of our skin tissue. Sorry. Okay, so this is my product and this is my hand. Okay, and beside it is the FDIR spectrum on my sample, the red one. I compare them with PVA PCL spectra. Okay, FDIR, FDIR spectrometry is a technique that can be used to identify whether my samples contains PVN, PVA, and PCL or not after electro spinning. By comparing the pig that only exists in the particular polymer, I can be very sure that my product contains PVA because of, of the OH bond here and, cup, uh, and PCL because of the carbonyl bond here. Okay, carbonyl bonds here. Okay, so we also conduct the mechanical study on my sample using tensile tester as shown in the slide. Okay, uh, so during the analysis, the machine will start pulling my sample outwards with a rate of 10 millimeters per minute. So my sample have a tensile strength around 2.5 MPa. It is considered quite strong and flexible for scaffold, but we're still not very satisfied on it, and we still think about other approach to improve it so that it get closer to our human skin, which is 4.5, 4.5 MPa. Okay. So after adding the PCL, the hydrophobic polymer into my product. Actually, we are not very sure that my, my scarfo still remain hydrophilic property or not. As a result, I conduct a contact angle analysis on my sample. Since my scarfo is not a fraction membrane, so I need to paste them on the glass before the analysis. So this is what happened during the analysis. Okay, so the, this one, the darker one, actually is my fiber. This is the glass, okay? So this is what happened during the analysis. Oh, no, this one. <coughs> okay, uh, sorry, due to some technician problems. Okay, uh, I can explain what is going to happen during the analysis. Actually, the water droplets is absorbed very fast by my fiber. And this proves that my fiber actually is very hydrophilic. And still remember, we need this property is because the hydrophilic polymer can enhance cell attachment and proliferation. Okay, in terms of the biocompatibility study, the MTT assay showed that my product is biocompatible, in which it's non-toxic to the cells because it showed a similar OD value to the control. And finally, the in vitro degradation. My product is biodegradable because it can degrade in the PVA solutions within seven days. In conclusion, electrospeeding is a 
most prom it's one of the more promising technique that we use to produce scar for skin tissue regeneration. And in this project, we produce a uh, scar for containing PVA, PCR, and chitosan, which shows excellent biocompatibility, chemical and physical property to our scalp skin tissue regeneration. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tan. Uh, another interesting presentation. We already had three interesting presentations today. Thank you. And I hope uh, we still have questions for the for the speaker. Okay, YC YC Tan, eh? I call you YC Tan, yeah? Okay. Okay, very interesting presentation. And um, when, when I combine this PVA with PCR, yes, yes. and you come out with the scarf all, is it? Yes. And chitosan is around 3% that you're trying to... 3%, yes. Yeah. So, um, then with this spinning techniques, tetro. Electro spinning techniques. Ah, electro spinning techniques. And then you come out with the nanofiber. Yes, I come out with nanofibers. Like nanofiber. Mm -hmm. And then I think in terms of... Uh, the electro spinning techniques, uh, mm -hmm. when you come out with the nanofiber, the size of contribution, I think you can you explain here how do you um, manage to come out with the nanofiber sizes? Okay. Okay. Actually, there's a lot of parameters that will affect the fiber diameter, but the most important one, I think, is the the properties of the polymers. For example, if we use the biomedical polymer size PCL and, and PVA, we can obtain the nanofiber very easily. But last time, when I studied the polysulfones, okay, uh, it will get it will give me the micrometers fibers. But we because my team we target to get the nanofibers, so what we actually can do is that we decrease the concentration or we increase the conductivity of the solution by adding the salts. Mm. This is how we control the fiber diameters. Mm. And it's very important for you to come up with the final product later, isn't it? Yeah, it's very because important. Mm. Then you are going to include with the chitosan inside. Yes, yes. Mm. So that the thing cannot be... No, no actually the, the chitosan is... Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, uh, for this case... Uh, Sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. The difference between this product is that this is uh, this is the product containing PVA and PCL, mm, okay. and this is the product containing PVA, PCL, and chitosan. Actually, the chitosan is inside the fibers. Mm. Oh, it's not absorbed. It's it's inside the it's inside the fibers. Yes. Fibers. It's fiber itself. Mm. Actually, we're also doing coating uh, using the PVA PCL, but we study the antibacterial activity. We found that uh, it's not very good. It's better we, we yeah we mix it inside. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tan. Um, very good uh, presentation and presentation. Um, since I am a mechanical engineer, I would like to ask about the process using the retro spinnings. Okay. Um, what is the uh, if if you uh, use the different range of uh, speed, is it will uh, affect uh, your product as a whole? And why do you use the twenty kV uh, supply because supply instead of low voltage? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Questions. Okay. Uh, Uh, first, about the feed rate. Okay, uh, for the biomedical uh, polymers, as I mentioned just now, we can easily get the nanofibers, so that the, actually the feed rate not contribute much for my product. But of, uh, yes, the vortex supplies uh, play a dominant uh, effect on my fibers uh, because the PVA's PVA's polymer uh, itself cannot be electrified into fibers if we if we using very low voltage. We actually we studied a lot of par uh, a lot before, and we found that if we use the vortex vortex less than twenty, we cannot get a fiber. We will get the nanoparticles. 
within the yeah, within the machine. Mm. How about the range of spinning? If you, if you slow down the spin of the uh, uh, the uh, what call it equipment, is it lead to the same product or the spin? Sorry, the spinning is here or here? The collector. The feed rate. The feed rate. Yes, we can now use a very high feed rate. For example, if we use two, uh, in, in my project, I use one milliliter per hour. Mm. As a result, in order to get the the size of fiber like I show to the judge, I need one day. Mm. Okay, but if we increase the time to two hours per per sorry two milliliter per hours, we will find that most of the chemical cannot form fiber before. Uh, sorry, it cannot form fiber. It will become a droplet. Yeah. Mm. That is why we keep using one milliliter per hour, although it's quite time consuming. Mm. Thank you. Okay, I have one question. In terms, if you want to produce it uh, for commercialization, is it going to be expensive? Uh, and how would you sell this to, to the market? Okay, uh, yes, we need, uh, we need to, uh, this is a very long journey in order to we, we commercialize the product. So in this coming September, I will go to UKM to apply the ethic to, to do the study on, on animals so that we see whether it can, uh, it can accelerate the wound healing process or not. Okay, and yeah, uh, in terms of price, actually, uh, just for the material, in order to get the Air Force size, uh, I count already, it's around 20, 20 ringgit for one Air Force size mm, membrane. So it, it can compete with the... Uh, competitors? The current one, as I mentioned just now, they're using skin grafting and the problem of the of the treatment is that it's quite difficult to get a suitable tissue. Yeah. Mm. And sometimes, most of the time, the patient cannot wait. And that is why, as I mentioned just now, it costs a lot of deaths annually. Mm. Alright. Thank you very much for your presentation and question. Thank you. for the um, interesting and enthusiastic presentation. Now, our fourth uh, finalist, I would like to invite Mr. Lam Jia Yong from UPM. And before that, let me introduce him. Okay, before that, um, the judges will need a five minute break. So the audience also will get a five minute break for the time being. We'll continue after five minutes. Thank you. I would like to invite Mr. Lam Jia Yong from UPM. And before that, let me introduce him. Okay, before that, um, the judges will need a five minute break. So the audience also will get a five minute break for the time being. We'll continue after five minutes. Thank you. Welcome back. We would like to resume our to our two finalists of presentation. Um, before our fourth finalist will present his lecture, let me introduce uh, himself first. Mr. Lam Jia Long is in his second year of PhD in medical microbiology at University Putra Malaysia, UPM. His doctoral research focuses on the development of biosensor to improve the current diagnostics for lepto leptospirosis, a disease of global importance. He also holds a master's degree from National Chia Yao Tong University, Taiwan. Please take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And I believe we are being recorded as well. So good morning to those watching in front of the screen. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelt as I'm about to take you to a trip to my PhD research. Do you all know what is this? It kind of looks like the brush that you use to clean your toilet. Well, honestly, it's not. This is optical fiber. The protagonist of my research, and this is what's, what that is going to get me my PhD degree, hopefully in the next two years, fingers crossed. I'm Jayong from University Putra, Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, do you remember this? Do you remember back then we had to go through this in order to connect to the internet? And the iconic sound it makes. Okay, so those were the days and they were all powered by the copper cable. Look how far we've come to now. Today, we have high-speed internets with the likes of Maxis, Unify and Time Fiber Internet, connecting each of us 24-7 right now. All this thanks to fiber optic, or also known as optical fiber. So what exactly is optical fiber? Well, they are thin, flexible, and transparent fiber made of silica, a material you can find almost anywhere. How big is it? I would say slightly thicker than a human hair. It was originally intended and has been widely used in the fields of communication. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the map of the undersea optical fiber around the world, connecting each of us right now. It's beautiful, right? So in fiber optics communication, our data, our information travels along the center of the fiber from one end to another in the form of light. So in other words, this means that our text messages our videos, our pictures, sounds, all are being encoded into pulses of light, and when it reaches this destination, it will be re-encoded into what we see on our screen. So, no doubt, optical fiber has had a major success in the fields of communication, but do you know that optical fiber also serves another purpose? A purpose you could not even imagine. What if I tell you optical fiber can be used for disease diagnosis? Here are the different variants of optical fiber that has been developed into a biosensor. Now, a biosensor, as the name itself, means an analytical device that can be used to detect for the presence of biological molecules in a sample. But in order for optical fiber to become a biosensor, it has to be immobilized. It has to be fixed with these kinds of biological recognition elements. So, for example, if we immobilize an enzyme on the surface of the fiber, it's going to capture the specific substrate. If we immobilize a DNA capture probe here, it's going to capture only the specific target DNA. The same goes for antibody. It will only capture the specific antigen. So the uprise of optical fiber has led us to develop new diagnostic method for diseases such as leptospirosis. Now, have you all heard of leptospirosis? Perhaps not this term, but what about a much more common term, rat urine disease, or in Bahasa Malaysia, we call it penyakit kencing tikus. This is an emerging and often neglected infectious disease. Annually, it costs about 1 million cases worldwide, resulting in almost 60,000 deaths. But how about in dear, our dear Malaysia? In Malaysia, I gotta say it's pretty alarming as well, because this disease affects countries in the tropical regions the most, and Malaysia is one of those countries in the tropical region. We see here in the incidence of leptospirosis in Malaysia, it is pretty alarming in 2014 and 2015. We see an upsurge in the incidence. Do you remember what happened in 2014 and 2015? we had major floods happening across different states in Malaysia. So this disease is the worst during natural disaster. It's like adding fuel to the fire. But why is it the worst during natural disaster? Let us take a look in how leptospirosis spread. So it is caused by the bacteria Leptospira. So hence the name of the disease, Leptospirosis. This bacteria is usually carried by rodents such as rats. So when rats urinate, this bacteria will be excreted along in their urine. 
And this bacteria containing urine will then contaminate our water, soil and food. So we humans are usually contracted with this disease by contact with contaminated water and urine in our eyes during water activities. Swallowing contaminated water and food and exposure of any open wounds to the contaminated water and soil. So now we know why this disease is the worst during natural disaster like floods because we are exposed. Once infected with leptospirosis, the signs and symptoms are such as fever, headache, skin rash, muscle pain, vomiting and diarrhea. But don't you think that this set of symptoms sounds familiar, right? We see the same set of symptoms in diseases such as dengue and malaria and perhaps influenza. Dengue is caused by a virus. Malaria is caused by a parasite. Leptospirosis is caused by a bacteria. Three different kinds of pathogen requiring three different kinds of treatment strategies. So in Malaysia, there are about 30% of leptospirosis cases being misdiagnosed for dengue. 30% is the real number, and it is a lot. I remember in, back in August 20, 2013, I received a devastating news that a friend of mine has passed. He was misdiagnosed for dengue because he had the same set of symptoms. And that during that time in his area, there is an upsurge in dengue cases. So the medicine that was prescribed to him was for dengue. But eventually it is not helping him and he succumbed. So overlapping symptoms and misdiagnosis are definitely the two main diagnostic challenges in leptospirosis. But to make matter worse, it is usually found co-infected with other diseases, making the diagnostic even much more a, daun a daunting process. So how do we go about it? How do we achieve better diagnostic? Now the key here lies with DNA biosensor. Because each of these pathogens, be it dengue, be it malaria or leptospirosis, each of them has their own unique DNA sequence. DNA biosensor here can tell the difference because it will only detect for leptospiral DNA. So this prompted me to look into the possibility of combining the optical fiber technology to develop a DNA biosensor that will only target the leptospiral DNA. And this will become a novel DNA biosensor for leptospirosis. So, but aren't you all curious how optical fiber can be used for biosensing purposes? Well, as I mentioned, light travels from one end to another end of the fiber by the total internal reflection principle. But take a closer look here. You see, light does not immediately decay to zero at the interface where reflection occurs. But instead, a portion of the light penetrates into this region here in the cladding. So, as I mentioned, light will penetrate into the cladding. But in the untapered fiber, it will not interact with the external environment. But with tapering process, it's going to make the diameter of the optical fiber thinner. That way, that penetrated light will be able to interact with the external environment. And it's very sensitive to any changes of the refractive index near this surface. So the idea is to develop a biosensor that can allow me to stick these DNA probes targeting leptospiral DNA on the third surface of the fiber. On the bottom panel here is the system setup where we have a light source, so light will travel through the optical fiber and analyzed by the optical spectrum analyzer. But how do we stick these DNA probes onto the surface of the fiber? This process is known as surface functionalization. So think of this as the burger we eat. Each of these steps here are like the different layers of burger to make it a complete burger. So we have the bottom bun of the burger, which is the bare taper fiber, and then we hydroxylate the fiber with NaOH. So this is the meat patty of the burger. And then followed by silanization by aptus, the cheese of the burger, crosslink by glutaraldehyde, which is any source of vegetable that we put on inside our burger. And lastly, the DNA Pro the top bun of the burger. So now there you have it. We have a complete burger. But in, in a burger, the usual bait is us, human. How about here? This DNA biosensor here. The bait of it is 
our target DNA samples. That means our leptospiral DNA. So in my research, if you take a look at this graph here, I know that this has the presence of the uh, leptospiral DNA, and this does not. So the difference between these two is the wavelength shift of the optical spectrum before and after the addition of DNA samples. In the case of non-matching DNA, there is no significant wavelength shift. Why? Because this DNA probe here does not target our target DNA. So before and after the addition of DNA sample, it's still the same DNA probe on the surface of the fiber. So there's no changes of the refractive index. But with the matching DNA, before and after the addition of DNA samples, our target DNA will bind to the DNA probe, thereby changing the refractive index on the surface of the fiber. So that is why we see a significant wavelength shift of the optical spectrum. So in my work, I have tested this biosensor on various strains of leptospira. Now these are all different strains of leptospira, all of them circulating within leisure. So we can see that it has produced a significant wavelength shift of the optical spectrum for all the leptospira, but not the other two non-leptospira related bacteria. So indicating that this biosensor is indeed very specific only towards leptospira bacteria. But now that we know it is specific, how about its sensitivity? This biosensor here can detect leptospira DNA from 0.1 nanogram per microliter to 0.001 nanogram per microliter. Now, to make things easier to imagine, 0.1 nanogram per microliter is like detecting a grain of rice in a fish tank. For 0.01 nanogram per microliter, it's like detecting a grain of rice in a bathtub, standard bathtub. And for 0.001 nanogram per microliter, it's like detecting a grain of rice in a water tanker. So now that we have a new specific and sensitive DNA biosensor against leptospiral DNA, do we stop here? No, because this piece of technology can be improved even further. We can improve the sensitivity of this biosensor here by combining it with nanomaterials and DNA amplification techniques. So instead of detecting a grain of rice in a water tanker, we are hopeful that we can detect a grain of rice in a swimming pool. So not just that, it can also be used for other diseases as well. All we have to do is just change the DNA capture probe to the ones that we want to detect. For example, if I want to detect HIV virus, I just change the DNA probe to only target HIV virus. So ladies and gentlemen, this piece of technology, we are hopeful that this piece of technology one day, with the help of material research everywhere, we can develop a, a novel DNA biosensor to revolutionize the field of biomedical diagnostic for the advancement of humankind and also technology. So there was once a saying, all this seems impossible, but Madiba Nelson Mandela, the late Nelson Mandela once said, all of this seems impossible until it is done. And yes, it's done. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Optical Fiber. Wow, very, very interesting presentation. Okay, I open it up to question from the panel of judges. Uh, I wish to clarify something. Like the, the sensor is actually, oh sorry, before that, good morning, Mr. Lama. It's okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, I wish to clarify something. When you say bio sensor, it's actually you're taking a DNA sample and then you drip it. Yes, exactly. So I presume it's a blood? Or saliva? Uh, for the moment, it was tested on extracted DNA. So there's no crude samples here dealing here because we are just testing on pure DNA itself. So in the future, we are planning to move on with crude samples. So that means blood or urine. Uh, how do you test in your research? What, what, how do you test in your research? What, what did you use? Uh, for now, I'm using pure DNA. That means we got the bacterial culture, that means uh, any oh, source of okay, bacterial culture, okay. so we extract the DNA. Alright, alright, you harvest it, okay. okay. Yeah. All right. okay. So, thank, thank you. Thank you for your question. Okay, J.Y. Lam, huh? Yes. Okay, mm, best of luck for your PhD. You are now in the second year, is it? Yes, I'm in the second okay. year. Okay, second year, but you already found some novelty there. Yeah. 
and uh, how do you get this uh, novelty that uh, I mean um, you're trying to find some gap of this particular studies mm -hmm. is it already carried out in overseas? Um, it has been carried out but on a different principle because what I did here was a tapered optical fiber which is quite novel and previously the previous researchers are dealing with uh, fluorescence signal mm -hmm. instead of the refractant uh, refract based on the refractive index changes and there are also some which is based on uh, photo inducible fluorescence as well so they kind of like activate the fluorescence if you are not using fiber sorry second question oh, sorry. not using fiber then why why uh, in your mind why why you think that uh, they are not using fiber actually? well because um, you, you see um, all the materials made of silica we have different sorts of material we have even these uh, the planar uh, glass uh, glass material, some sort of glass material, but optical fiber is just one of it. So actually, this is a collaboration between my faculty, uh, because I'm from Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, with the collaboration of Faculty of Engineering of UPM. So uh, that's my co-supervisor, so they kind of like specializes in the fields of photonics, so they are dealing with optical fiber, and they have just found out it can also be used for biosensing, so that's why I just give it a try, and test it on my model organism, which is Leptospira. Thank you, for you. Hmm? For you. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Question from me. I saw that you put the nanomaterials. Mm, yes. Uh, can you explain how exactly <coughs> nanomaterials can help you in this? And is it materials going to play a very important role? Or? Yes, uh, definitely. Because in the preliminary, actually, uh, I, already, I already conducted it. Uh, with the addition of nanomaterials like carbon quantum dot, we first put in, uh, functionalize the fiber with carbon quantum dot. That way, it will increase the surface area of the fiber. So more and more DNA probe is going to attach there so that it can detect even the slightest amount of DNA present in our target samples. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Right. Uh, thank you very much to Mr. Lam Jia Yong from UPM. Now we have come to our last uh, finalist, Mr. Ang Kok Bin from University of Malaya. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kok Bin received his bachelor degree in physics from University of Malaya in 2017. He works as research assistant in Photonic Research Center University of Malaya during. 2018. Now he is pursuing his PhD degree in physics, optics under the My Brain Scholarship. His research interests mainly focus on optical non-linearities in materials. Now, sir, your stage, uh, the stage is yours. All the best. Thank you, Damson. As we know, he, he is from University of Malaya. The presentation title is Keeping Light on tr Track via 3D Polymeric Microstructuring. So, all the best. <laughs> Thank you. So, a very good morning to the honorable judges, organizers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. This is an optical fiber, and I believe from the last presenter, he had, he had already introduced part of the application of the optical fiber in the, in the biomedical application. But now, I would like to talk more, deep, a little bit deeper into the application of fiber optics in the fiber optic communication. So now, what is an optical fiber and what makes it so amazing? In general, an optical fiber is like a highway and light is the racer sprinting through this highway while carrying our data, information, and messages to all over the world. Take a look at the screen over here. Imagine you are searching for something using internet. Your question will be carried by light through an optical fiber and reach to Google. Then Google will search for the answer and send it back to you via another fiber. So in general, you will need two fiber in order to complete the process. However, 
definitely there is more than one person who wants to connect with Google, right? By the end of 2018, there is about 28 million of internet users in Malaysia. So if one person needs two fibers, are we going to have a total of 56 million of optical fiber planted underground in Malaysia just so that everyone can connect with Google? Certainly not. Therefore, we will need something that can connect multiple users using only just one single optical fiber. In order to do that, scientists have invented something called the Plana Lightwave Circuit Splitter, or in short, a PLC splitter. So this PLC splitter literally is to split light from one input channel into multiple output channels, while each channel corresponding to an optical fiber. So although the name is called splitter, it actually can work the other way around, which is by combining multiple lights from multiple input channels into just one single output channel. So the magic of this splitting and recombining of lights lies within the little box over here. So now, let's open out the box and have a look what's inside. When you first open out the box, first you will see a piece of glass with a thickness of 4 millimeters. If you look closer to it, then you will see a lot of narrow lines on top of it. So this line will then serve as a track of a train, like a track of a train, which helps us to bring the light to the place we wanted it to go. So the animation here showing how light being guided and split inside a PLC splitter. As you can see, every time when the lights encounter the junction, it will split from one into two. As a result, lights coming in from one single input channel can be split into eight different output channels. So using this kind of PLC splitter, the maximum splitting you can achieve can actually go up to a total of 64 output channels. This means that in a housing area of 200 households, for example, you only need three of these PLC splitter in order to split the light, the internet signal for everyone. And the best part of the PLC splitter is that it also helps to ensure that every user at the output channels will get the same quality of the internet. And that's very important. Imagine if the splitting is not good, then some of you might get a better internet, or some of you might not even get the internet. And I believe those of you will just go on crazy. Okay, so now we have seen how the light being guided and split inside the PLC splitter. The next question will be, how do we ensure that the light will just stay within the track? Why don't the light just go to somewhere else, right? So in order to under understand this, let's have a look at the basic principle of the reflection and refraction of light. So every time when the light strikes on the surface, it will either be reflected or refracted. If you look from the side, then you will see that the reflection and refraction of lights can actually occur at the same time. But if the incident light hits the surface at an angle greater than the critical angle, then all the light will be totally reflected. So this is what we call a total internal reflection. So this kind of phenomenon will occur if and only if the light is traveling from a denser medium towards a less dense medium. So now, imagine if we have a design like this, where the denser medium at the middle, surround it with a less dense medium, then we actually can trap the lights within the denser medium while using the total internal reflection. And that's the reason why the light will just stay within the track and not going to somewhere else. So with all the knowledge about the PLC splitter, how do we make them? In order to fabricate a PLC splitter, first you will need a, a substrate, which is usually a piece of glass. So on top of this glass, we will coat a layer of photoresist. So photoresist is a kind of special chemical solution which react with UV light. And we are going to turn this layer of photoresist to the PLC splitter later on by using something called the photomask. So on the photomask, we pre-pattern the design of the splitter that we wanted on top of it. And when we shine the UV light from the top, some of the light will be blocked by the photomask while some of the light will just pass through it and reach to the photoresis. So the exposed photoresis will become hardened, and therefore, after we remove the photomask, we can also remove the unexposed photoresis by, washing, by simply washing it away, and left only the hardened photoresis with the design of the splitter show over here. So this kind of fabrication technique is uh, very, a little bit complicated, but yet it is very efficient even at industrial level. The reason is very straightforward because you can fabricate multiple optical splitter at the same time as long as you have the correct design of the photomask. However, 
there is still remains some, some challenges inside this kind of fabrication technique and I'm going to show you how. First, the fabrication is a costly process. The reason is the photoresist and the photo mask that we were using are both expensive material. And then during the fabrication process, the device is extremely sensitive to, sensitive to dust. It is because the dimension of the splitter that we were talking about is just a few micrometer, which is much thinner than your hair. Therefore, every pinch of dust dropped onto the devices during the fabrication will greatly affect the quality of the fa fabricated device. Therefore, the whole process needs to be done inside a clean room, which is a dust-free environment. And that clean room will actually cost you for more than 100,000 of Ringgit Malaysia for the size of just of this room. And as we all know, Glass is fragile, it breaks easily. Since we are using glass as a substrate, you will need to be extra careful during or even after the fabrication is complete. And lastly, the fabrication technique is only allows us to fabricate a 2D PLC splitter in which the splitting of the light just go to the left and to the right only. And that had greatly limit the application potential of the current PLC splitter. So now, in order to overcome all this problem, there is at least two things in mind. First, to find a new material which is tougher than glass and secondly, to find a new fabrication technique which allows us not only to fabricate a 2D PLC splitter but one step further, a three-dimensional PLC splitter. Therefore, my lecture today entitles Keeping Light on Track via 3D Polymeric Microstructuring. My name is Kok Bin and I'm coming from University of Malaya. The material that I'm going to use is a material called CR39. It is actually a polymer substrate and people have started to use CR39 as the replacement to the manufacture, as a replacement to glass in the manufacturing of the eyeglass lenses. The reason is very straightforward. CR39 is lighter than glass, it is cheaper than glass, and most importantly, CR39 is a type of plastic. Therefore, it will be less likely to break as compared to a glass. On top of that, during the experiment, we also found that CL39 has some unique interaction with laser. And that's the reason why we have chosen this CL39 as the material for the fabrication of our splitter. So here's I'm, what, what, what we are going to do. We are going to make the splitter inside the CL39 using a technique called laser direct writing. So laser direct writing literally means to directly write or directly draw the design of the splitter inside the CL39 using laser. The idea is very simple, just like this. Just like you write something on a paper using your pen, but now instead of using a pen to do the drawing, we are using a laser. But before I go talk about how I'm going to do the drawing, there's a few things about laser that you should know first. First, laser power. Laser pointer, I believe is the most commonly available laser source, has a power of about 5 milliwatts. Okay? It's a very small power but still high enough to cause some damage to your eye. However, the laser in our lab can actually go up to a 34 kilowatts, which is 7 million times stronger than a single laser pointer. And then, the spot size. Every time when you shoot the laser on the wall, on the screen, you will observe a very bright spot. So that's the spot that we were talking about. So for the same laser power, you actually can control the, can, you actually can make the spot size as large as a few meter, or you can concentrate all the laser power into a very, very small spot of two micrometer, and that focusing spot, the laser intensity will get so extremely high in such a way that it not only able to blind your eye immediately it enters to your retina, it also able to cause some burning to the paper, damage your clothes, or even your skin. And yes, we are going to use this kind of laser to do the drawing. Okay, so here is the experiment setup. We have our CL39 placed right before an objective lens. So when the high power laser passes through the objective lens, it will be focused down to a very, very small spot size of 2 micrometer inside the CL39. So the high intensity, high intensity laser will immediately create a damaged spot inside the CL39. So here's the interesting part. This kind of damage can be created if and only if the laser has sufficient intensity. With that in mind, we can actually control the laser intensity in such a way that it is highest at the center while lower at the side. Therefore, 
only the part of the CL39 which exposed to the high intensity laser will get heat up, melted and reconstruct itself to form a high density region while the rest of it which is not affected by the low intensity laser will just stay in their original state which having a relatively lower density. So now, we have a high density region surrounded by a lower density medium Recall back to how light being guided and split inside the PLC splitter using the total internal reflection. We actually have done the first step of light guiding. So the next step that we are going to do is to design the trap. So now, the, this step is very simple. What you need to do is just simply place your CRT9 onto a translational stage in which it can move the sample across the laser's focus spot and voila, you have your design already. So this is what we have done inside our lab. Okay, it's a very simple design and we call this as a straight channel waveguide. It has been proved to, proven to be light guiding and the next step that we are going to do is to place a CL39 onto a 3D translational stage to realize the 3D optical splitter like this. So the idea of, so the picture is here shows the idea of a 3D optical splitter. So now, the idea of the 3D optical splitter is like this. The splitting of lights is not go, only go to the left and right only this time, but at the same time, to the up, and to the down. So what's so great about this? Imagine the light coming in from one level can be split into four different levels vertically while each level can be further split to the left and to the right for 64 output channels. What will you have at the end? By doing some simple mathematical calculation, you will find that you will actually have a total of 256 output channels inside a single OPCL39 chips. And Therefore, again, in a housing area of 200 household, you are just now you only need one of these 3D optical splitter inside cl to split the light, the internet signal for everyone. And that's not the limit of the 3D optical splitter in cl The only limitation is the thickness of the cl sample, as well as the total number of output channels that you wanted. So by using laser directing, it actually offers us several advantages. It not only al allows us to fabricate a 3D optical splitter, but at the same time, to, fr to do the fabrication in an environmentally friendly manner. The reason is straightforward. We are not using any chemical solution during the process, and that leads to the next point, which is a low cost production. Since besides we are not using any extensive chemical solution, we are now fabricating the PLC splitter inside the sample. Therefore, any dust from the environment will not have any effect to the device fabricated inside the sample, and therefore we do not need a clean room facility. And that will actually save you for 100,000 of Ringgit Malaysia. And besides that, now, since now we are using a CL39 instead of glass, it is tougher than glass, and it is less likely to break as compared to the glass, and I believe that will actually prolong the lifetime of the devices that we fabricated. So now, what more can we do? Actually, the 3D optical splitter inside the cl is not only meant for splitting light in an internet system. It actually can be applied in any system that uses light as the data carrier. For instance, in medical, just now you're doing the cancer sense, biosensor, t optic, uh, cable TV, military telecommunication system, as well as your car temperature sensor. Besides that, optical splitter, the PLC splitter, is just one of the many examples of the optical devices that we have right now. Together with the laser directing, we can actually combine all the de op uh, optical devices together to form a 3D photonic integrated circuit like this, just like the electronic photonic integrated circuit. So in the future, we might be able to apply this kind of 3D photonic circuits into our handphone or even our computer to realize the lightweight, low cost, and the fastest processor of all time using light. Therefore, it's very important to keeping your light on track, and with that, I end my lecture here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ong um, Kok Bing. Thank you. Again, another interesting presentation by all uh, one of the participants. Yes. Hi. You uh, just started your PhD? Yeah, I just How started. How long already? Um, about nine months. Oh, nine months. Huh? Yeah. So, please consider your proposal. Huh? Presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Proposal. 
and you are working on the CR39. Yes. So, um, based on uh, your presentation and you are trying to use the CR39 as a material for you to, so that the, the light, the laser light would be direct to obstruct whatever things within the control, isn't it? Yes. This is what you mentioned to us. So, um, based on the your literature itself, can you share with us what's your findings and what are the things that have been done so far by other uh, uh, studies that carry out by other researchers on this uh, CR39, whether they are using this or not? Or you are the one, first one going to investigate on this? All right. Okay, thank you for your question. So actually, CR39 is the, uh, actually this kind of laser directing technique to write a optical splitter, there is uh, a list of material, for instance, PMMA, polystyrene, as well as uh, one thing is called PVL, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the, the name already. Okay, so but CR39 is the first one. That we are, that the only us are doing using this CR39 to do the optical splitter. So you um, talk, speaking of the optical splitter, the one of the main thing about the efficiency of the splitter itself is the power. It's a power loss. When we, because the laser power itself, it has, it has a power. For laser pointer, it has five milliwatts. Okay. So after passing through the optical splitter, how much power it left? Okay. So usually, uh, for the best of the optical splitter that we have, the the if the the power loss cannot be more than like. Five to ten percent. It, it has to be controlled within, 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 within the percentage, and that would that can be actually be controlled using the laser parameter. So during the fabrication, okay. So just now I'm 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 mentioning about I'm using the high power laser, the high intensity laser to do the drawing, right? So the intensity of the laser will affect the quality of the will, will affect the efficiency, as well as the part of the CR39 move, movement. How fast I translate my sample. Okay, how slow I transmit my sample because the slower you translate your sample, it will uh, cause the more energy to be accumulated at each spot of the laser hitting hitting on the hitting inside the sample, and that will create more damage to the sample. And throughout my throughout my experiment, I found that using the slower speed, it can actually provide us to have a better efficiency of the waveguide. Okay, so that's one. That's what a, a few things that have, that have been done. But throughout the literature, there is also a, another parameter that can be controlled. Okay, that can be used. They can play with to control the efficiency of the waveguide, such as the pulse width, because we are using a laser pulse. So the pulse width of the laser, the repetition rate of the laser, the wavelength of the laser, and so on. So now currently, tr because of the limitation of our devices of, of our. Uh, instrument okay so I only can use can play with the intensity and the fluence which is the scanning speed of the devices and that's it <laughs> thank you okay Mr. Ng thank you and a uh, very good explanation uh, and presentation just uh, one question from me um, if I'm not mistaken correct me if I'm wrong uh, your presentation here is uh, actually a sort of improvement to the existing system uh, for example, uh, for the internet service, right? So, um, for uh, current uh, system for internet service, what kind of material they use for the splinter and uh, for your uh, proposal? Is it uh, any losses of the signal strength, or is a uh, one-to-one or uh, same output and input signal strength? All right, thank you for your question. So currently, for the current technology, okay, it, it, they use silica, which is a glass, as a splitter. Okay, you can find it in your distributed po distribute point, okay, around your housing area. Okay, you will see a little gray box over here. If you open up, you, you will see a, 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 little, a little gray box inside the, inside the big gray box. Okay, so that's a splitter. Okay, and then the, the material they are, they, they are using is a splitter. So a splitter, is, it works like this. If it is a one by two splitter in which the lights coming in from one input and split into two output, so the hundred percent of lights will be split separate into fifty fifty. Okay, if it's one by four, then twenty five, twenty five, twenty five, twenty five. Okay, so in terms of the power loss, currently they have the the minimal loss they can get achieved is zero point zero five dB per cent per centimeter, which means that corresponding to about 
10% of the power loss. So we are working on it to, to, to get the similar efficiency of the optical splitter. All right, and the best part of the and and the best part of the of, of the proposal is that the current PLC splitter they is just two two dimensional. So you will need three PLC splitter for the housing area of two hundred person per the household, for example. So uh, because the fiber fib the fiber itself is very bulky, so if you have m more of the PLC splitter, then you will need a, a, a very large space to store the PLC splitter. So now, if we can have to to have something that is everything inside one chip, then we can actually set up some cost as, as well as a, as a space during the manufacturing. Thank you. Now I have a question. Uh, since you say that the current splitter using silicon, silica, silica. silica right? So if, if this thing is going to work, does it mean that you have to replace everything uh, with the new material or? Is it going to affect the current existing system? Uh, thank you for your question. Okay, so not necessary. It depends. Okay, the answer can be yes and can be no. It depends on the application. What kind of application that you wanted? Okay, for instance, this is a 3D optical splitter. Okay, so you can split ma many output channels in one in one chip. So do you really need something that in a in the housing area, do you really, really need that? If you if you need so much of the optical output channels in in a housing area, then go ahead. But if you just need might like split from one into sixty four, then you might just use a a a, a, a not a usual PLC splitter. So that depends on the application, okay. And some more during during the so just I suggest that uh, in in the future we might be able to to apply this kind of PLC splitter in the, our our handphone, our computer, right? So in that case, we might need to use a lot of network. We may connect many, many networks together. So by that time, the 3D optical speeder will come in hand. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for thank your you. presentation. Presentation from Mr. Ern Cobbin. We conclude our MLC 2019 final. So while waiting for the judges' deliberation on the results, please stay in your seat and enjoy an interesting montage on our journey for MLC 2019. Uh, the, the video will consist of the semi-finals videos and photos. Please enjoy. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala al-ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mushalim. Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Yang berbahagia, Asosiat Profesor Dr. Zamri bin Jamaluddin, Dean of Fakulti Kejuteraan Pembuatan, Universiti Teknikal Malaysia Melaka. Yang berusaha, Profesor Dr. Esa binti Hamza, Chairperson of IMM, MLC on behalf of President of IMM. Yang berusaha, Asosiat Profesor Dr. Jariah binti Muhammad Joy, Chairperson of MLC 2019. Distinguished guests, participants, University representatives, ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to the closing ceremony of Materials Lecture Competition 2019. Sudilah Tuan Jalan Belapan, Jalan Belapan di Malam Kelam. Sudilah Tuan beri ucapan kata penutup pemanis kalam. Ladies and gentlemen, without any delay, I would like to request yang berusaha Professor Dr. Esa Binti Hamza, Chairperson of IMM MLC on behalf of President IMM for the closing speech of MLC 2019 and the announcement of the next host of MLC 2020. Please welcome Professor. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum. Berusaha Associate Professor Dr. Jariah Muhammad Joy Chairperson LMC 2019 All the esteemed judges Professor Datuk uh, Engineer Dr. Abdul Wahab uh, Associate Professor 
Engineer Dr. Punesh. I cannot call your name, it's okay, too long. Okay. This is, I, I was told okay, that Punesh is your glamour name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, engineer um, William Ho and Engineer uh, Fairu Rizam. Uh, and it gives me great pleasure to greet and welcome all guests and judges, participants, uh, finalists uh, of MSC 2019 final. Uh, the competition is the brainchild of uh, IMM uh, to give an opportunity to our young students and researchers below the age of 28, uh, particularly in the areas of material to showcase uh, their capability and share their knowledge uh, in issues pertaining to materials and their roles in society. Uh, it is an honour and privilege for Institute of Material Malaysia, Institute of Materials, Mineral and Mining UK, as well as University Technical Melaka uh, Malaysia to organize a competition that has become an important annual event uh, in the calendar of IMM. In addition to providing career investment opportunities for non-professional members uh, through technical certification and educational training courses for skill, uh, IMM also aims to help uh, to reach out to young material scientists and engineers to foster long-lasting relationships. As the president of IMM, I encourage all members of the academia, industries and students uh, to play an active role in promoting materials uh, in Malaysia by joining IMM and be the forefront of their activities. Uh, I would like to thank IOM3 UK for their support, University Technical Malaysia Melaka for hosting and co-organizing this year's event. This is the first time uh, the event is held outside the Klang Valley. My appreciation and gratitude go to MIC 2019 and UTEM Organizing Committee and all, all those involved in making uh, this lecture competition a successful event. I also would like to extend uh, my thanks to competition judges uh, who have accepted our invitation uh, despite their busy schedule. My congratulations to all the five finalists who have won the top five places in the MIC semi-final uh, whereby there are 20 public uh, and private university in Malaysia participate in the uh, competition. Uh, I wish all the best to the first winner uh, who will represent Malaysia uh, in London in October uh, this year. Once again, I would like to congratulate UTEM, and, uh, M which is uh, MSC host and co-organizer uh, for organizing this event and especially to Associate Professor Dr. Jariah Muhammad Joy, uh, as well as her team for their dedication uh, to organize and make this event a success. Finally, on behalf of IM President, I would like to announce that the new host and co-organizer for next year competition, MSC 2020, is University Putra Malaysia. And the new MSC chairperson will be Dr. Norkhairun Nisa Mazlan. So we wish all the best uh, to UPM. I also would like to announce that the first winner of MSC 2019, which will be announced shortly, uh, we represent Malaysia in the Young Person World Lecture Competition in London in October 2019, fully sponsored by IOM3 UK. And the MSC 2019 chairperson, Associate Professor Dr. Jaria, will accompany him to London and sponsored by IMM. Uh, with that, in Alafas Bismillah, I officially close the MSC 2019 event. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Professor, for the speech. Now, I would like to invite Yang Berbahagia, Professor Madia, Dr. Zamri Benjamaludin, Dean of Fakulti Kejuteraan Perbuatan on behalf of Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic and Internationalization University Technical Malaysia Melaka, accompanied by Yang Berusaha Associate Professor Dr. Jaria Binti Muhammad Joy, Chairperson of MLC 2019 to the stage. Please welcome.
Without further ado, I would like to invite all the judges for souvenirs and certificate as a token of appreciation for their service for today's competition. Uh, calling upon Yang Bosa, Professor Dato Insenio, Dr. Abdul Wahab bin Muhammad. Associate Professor and Senior Dr. Pervanas Baran, A. Perumal. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, Insinio Fairulizam bin Isa. And last but not least, our final judge is Insinio William Ho. Please, uh, both of you to stay on the stage. Certificates and souvenirs to our sponsor, HML Auto Industries. Please welcome Mr. Afiq Ani to the stage. Thank you for both, Mr. Professor, for the presentation. I would like to request once again Yang, to, uh, yang Berusaha Profesor Dr. Esah binti Hamza accompanied by Yang Berusaha Dr. Jariah binti Muhammad Joy to the stage <laughs> Okay, uh, yes, sorry On behalf of IMM President <laughs> Alright the first token of appreciation will go to MLC 2019 Advisor, Associate Professor Dr. Zamri bin Jamaluddin. Chairperson for MLC 2019, Associate Professor Dr. Jariah binti Muhammad Joy. Apa yang sini? Please stand to the centre of the stage. <laughs> And next, um, MLC 2019, Deputy, Deputy Chairperson, Professor Dr. Aziza Binti bin Syakban. Please, please go to the centre of the stage. Okay. Next, our also Deputy Chairperson of MLC 2019, Associate Professor Dr. Nuraiham Binti Muhammad. <laughs> and now, last but not least, a presentation of plaque to UTEM received by <coughs> Associate Professor Dr. Jariah Binti Muhammad Joy from IMM. 
Now uh, we will present the plug to our next host for MLC 2020 to Inusi Putra Malaysia. The certificate, sorry, the certificate to our next host, MLC 2020, Inusi Putra Malaysia. to stay on the stage. Yes. <laughs> right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the moment of truth, the announcement of the winner of MLC 2019. Uh, before that, uh, let us read the win... Uh, the, what, what, are the uh, what are the prizes for the winner? For the consolation prize... For the consolation prize, uh, it is consists of 500 ringgit plus certificate and souvenir. And also the consolation prize, for two consolation prize, five hundred ringgit plus certificate and souvenir. Whereas the third winner will receive one thousand ringgit plus a plug, a certificate, and also a souvenir. For the second winner, uh, he or she will get a two thousand ringgit Malaysia plug, certificate, and souvenir. While the winner for today will receive three thousand ringgit Malaysia plug, certificate, souvenir, and will represent Malaysia at the IOM3 Young Person World Lecture Competition in London, UK in October. Without further ado, we would like to invite Yang Berusaha Professor Datuk Insinyur Dr. Abdul Wahab bin Muhammad to announce the result. Please welcome. First of all, okay, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to present to to announce the result today. It has been a very competitive um, fight, lah. Okay, it's not fight, lah. Presentation by the by the participants, and we find it very difficult, yeah, to to decide on who is going to represent Malaysia in in London. Yeah, I hope whoever is selected. Um, will give his or her best yeah, to represent Malaysia and if you are not selected still you are the best yeah, in, 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 in the judges eyes yeah? all of you have given your best in terms of um, in terms of uh, trying to make materials interesting yeah. okay <coughs> so I'm going to announce from um, consolation prize first yeah Suspend lah. <laughs> Actually saya yang suspend. Okay. Consolation prize. Since then fifth place winner. Tak pula yeah. ni. Since concentration uh, consolation uh, the the first two consol consolation prize um, goes to Siti Hajar Zaid Amri from Malaysia Malaysia Kanta. Second consolation prize goes to Ng Kok Bin, University of Malaya. There's no music here. It's okay. <laughs> Siti Zubaidah Patuan from Ministry of Malaysia Sabah.
So I have to announce the the winner. The winner. <laughs> so there are two left. Um, I'll announce the winner, but then we we'll give the second winner uh, prize lah. All right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so the winner who represent Malaysia in MLC, yeah, yeah, this year, uh, IOM three, whatever, is. Lam Jia Yong, University of Putra, Malaysia. And the second winner is Tan Yong Chi from University of Technology, Malaysia. So we invite Tan Yong Chi. Tan, Tan. Dulu. Okay, the, and, and as I mentioned to you, the winner is Lam Jia Yong. He, he will represent Malaysia in Young Person World Lecture Competition in London in October 2019. Congratulations to all the winners and thank you very much, Prof, uh, for the prize giving ceremony. Congratulations to all the winners and the final winner also. Daun selasih permainan budak, bunga melur berwaru wangi, bertaut kasih bercerai tidak, panjang umur berjumpa lagi. Bunga seroja di atas para jatuh ditimpa buah berangan. Andai kata tersilap bicara, maaf jua kami pohonkan. On behalf of the organizing committee members, we would like to apologize for any mistakes uh, or even lack of awareness that we are intentionally had, had done during the competition. Thanks for coming and supporting the MLC 2019. Thank you and see you again. Thank you very much. And before that, I would like to invite all the winners and the judges also to the stage to to give a, to take a photo session. For the ujung, we would like to invite Yang Berusaha Professor Datuk Insinyur Dr. Abdul Wahab bin Muhammad to announce the result. Please welcome. First of all, okay, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to present to to announce the result today. It has been a very competitive um, fight, lah. Okay, it's not fight, lah. Presentation by the by the participants, and we find it very difficult, yeah, to to decide on who is going to represent Malaysia in in London. Yeah, I hope whoever is selected. Um, will give his or her best yeah, to represent Malaysia and if you are not selected still you are the best yeah, in, 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 in the judges eyes yeah? all of you have given your best in terms of um, in terms of uh, trying to make materials interesting yeah. okay <coughs> so I'm going to announce from uh, um, consolation prize first yeah Suspend lah. <laughs> At least saya yang suspend. Okay. Consolation prize. This is the fifth place winner. 
tak pula yeah. ni since concentration uh, consolation uh, the, the first two consolation prize um goes to Siti Hajar Zaid Amri from Universiti Malaysia Kuantan The second consolation prize goes to Ng Kok Bin, University of Malaya. The third winner, there's no music here, so okay. <laughs> Siti Zubaidah Patuan from Ministry of Malaysia Sabah. So I have to announce the the winner. The winner. Okay. <laughs> so there are two left. Um, I'll announce the winner, but then we give the second winner uh, prize lah. All right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So the winner who represent Malaysia in MLC, yeah, yeah, this year, uh, I am three, whatever, is Lam Jia Yong, University of Malaysia, and the second winner is Tan Yong Chi from University Technology Malaysia. So we invite Tan Yong Chi. Tan, Tan. Dulu. Okay, the, and, and as I mentioned to you, the winner Islam Jia Yong, he, he will present Malaysia in Young Person World Lecture Competition in London in October 2019. Congratulations to all the winners and thank you very much, Prof, uh, for the prize giving ceremony. Congratulations to all the winners and the final winner also. Daun selasih pemainan budak, bunga melur berwaru wangi, betaut kasih bercerai tidak, panjang umur berjumpa lagi. Bunga seroja di atas para jatuh ditimpa buah berangan. Andai kata tersilap bicara, maaf jua kami pohonkan. On behalf of the organizing committee members, we would like to apologize for any mistakes uh, or even lack of awareness that we intentionally had, had done during the competition. 
Thanks for coming and supporting the MLC 2019. Thank you and see you again. Thank you very much. And before that, I would like to invite all the winners and the judges also to the stage to to give a to take a photo session. Take. We would like to. No, Misunderstanding. Uh, misunderstanding. Okay. So what we can do now? <laughs> Alright. So we will start our photo session just right after the. Uh, sit right now. Bule. Photo session. Okay, I would like to request all the participants bring all the plugs to the stage. Okay. Nice congratulations to all the winners. Okay, thank you so much. Please take a seat for a bit. Okay. Before we adjourn our our ceremony, we would like to have a final a final prize giving for for the MLC, MLC and IMM. And with that, I would like to invite Associate Professor Dr. Zamri Ben Jamudin, accompanied by Associate Professor Dr. Jari. Dr. Jaria, Ms. Dima Mat Joy, to the stage. Okay. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> My apologies. And now, I would like to invite uh, Professor Dr. Esa Binti Hamza to the stage to be given a certificate and also a token of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barb. And now that marks the end, the actual end of our ceremony. And we would like to invite you to have some refreshments and lunch in the in the Dewan Jam 1. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, see you. Assalamualaikum. See you in London. Oh, yeah. <laughs>